welcome once again. My name is uh, Brian Rondo from uh, uh, Uganda. And for us in Uganda right now, we are experiencing a 42 day lockdown. So uh, everyone is in their homes as we uh, go through this uh, uh, phase. Uh, but uh, I want to welcome you once again uh, to the Mac Foundation Health Media Training. This training is held in partnership with Media Trust Mauritius. Uh, thank you so much for uh, choosing to work with us to make sure that uh, the work that we do uh, goes on, uh, even despite the pandemic. Uh, to all the speakers that are on this call, thank you to all the media partners from Mauritius, Madagascar, and Seychelles. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. The objective of this training is to emphasize the significant role that media plays Donc, to break nous allons travailler the stigma à around infertility in addressing sensitive social and health issues such as breaking uh, that stigma, empowering girls and women uh, through uh, education. And in times like these, raising awareness about the coronavirus and the best health prevention practices during this global pandemic. So thank you for taking off time uh, of your busy schedules to uh, be with us as we, uh, you know, learn from each other. And, and just so you know, Mac Foundation has trained 1,700 media representatives from more than 30 countries uh, across Africa and Latin America. So, uh, there's a lot of work to be done, but we've done, you know, a good amount of work. Before we start, we'd like to emphasize that uh, all of you, please keep your uh, mute buttons on, unless when you're speaking, and uh, preferably your, your, your video, uh, only those who are presenting should be able to activate uh, those videos and audio session uh, audio buttons but during these sessions if you have any questions uh, please type them in uh the the chat box uh we'll be making sure that we get those questions and asking uh our speakers uh, thank you once again uh i was in mauritius uh, in 2018, I think, and it was such a beautiful country. I can't wait to come back uh, to Mauritius. I can't wait to be in Madagascar and Seychelles uh, when uh, the pandemic, you know, is certainly uh, over. Um, uh, also, our our host, Senator Dr. Rasha Kelech, uh, will be joining us in a few minutes. I'll let you know uh, when she comes. And so to open uh, this training, let me welcome uh, an obstetrics and gynecologist consultant at uh, Rundu Private Hospital in Namibia, Dr. Lugano Ndovi. Welcome. All right. Thank you, Brian, for, for the introduction. And um, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity that um, I can speak to you on um, the topic regarding management of um, infertility and what message do we need to uh, give to the communities uh, at large in terms of prevention and we'll also basically look at the link in terms of how um, infectious diseases affect infertility as well as um, how we can motivate for um, better communities and how we can prevent um, uh, infertility. So my first presentation, uh, next slide, we'll be looking at management of um, couples with infertility. And like Brian said, the, the goal is for us to try and break the stigma around infertility. So most of the things that I'll be talking about is we'll try and make it as simple as possible because I know we don't have to bring you all the medical books to you guys, but it's just to try and make it as easy as possible to understand what are the issues and what sort of information we can communicate to our community. So the goal is to try and break the stigma around infertility. Next slide. So my uh, flow of the presentation on the, the first part will be looking at um, basically what is the 
the anatomy or how things are when it comes to, to fertility and then what will be the the main causes of infertility we'll look at female and male causes of infertility and what are the basic treatments now when we understand those then we can look at why is it um that we should be saying that it shouldn't be a stigma when it comes there shouldn't be any stigma when it comes to around uh, infertility next slide so for the normal um, human being for us to be able to reproduce for the female um, we need to have the following we need to have what we call the uterus we need to have the tubes we need to have the ovaries and we need to have um, the hormones that are able to work uh, on the ovaries for them to produce the eggs i'll show the pictures in the next slide for us to probably understand better these terms and again, for the for the male partner, we we need to have what we call testicles. We need the penis, and we also need um, hormones as well to be working. So the first um, picture shows exactly how the um, the reproductive system is in the male partner. So we need hormones that will work on the testicles for them to produce the semen that will be stored in the tube that is written epididymis at the time that it is ready for ejaculation then those will come through all the way out of the penis through um, all the channel coming out during the time of ejaculation and at that time that's when we see the semen that comes out and then the next slide shows the actual reproductive system in the female section so again we want to have the ovaries from which the eggs come from and they go through the fallopian tubes um, to go into the uterus and um, the, uh, the opening for the uterus is actually through the cervix and the vagina and um, when a man ejaculates then the sperms will pass through the vagina into the cervix and then that's where they will meet the the eggs so bas basically this is how the the reproductive system is both in a male and female partner now when we'll be talking about problems uh, with um, infertility it means that most of these structures will be the ones where they are affected so when 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 this system is affected both in the male and the female that's when issues of infertility uh, arises so how is a baby conceived? Basically, we need the ovum, which is the egg from the female partner to be released. And this is only released at a particular time in a month. Um, and then also the sperms that are ejaculated from the male to meet together with the ovum or the egg. And when the two meet, that's when fertilization happens. When that fertilization has occurred, then that process of pregnancy starts to develop and that has to implant into the womb or into the uterus and then the pregnancy starts to grow over a period of nine months then the child is born so that's the natural way of how things happen therefore if there is any problem in that system that will lead to infertility in both the male and in the female uh, partner. Next slide. So the next slide basically has just explained what I said. The first, um, number one, we need to have the sperms that are released in the vagina and those that will go into the uterus. And if it is at the correct time when the egg has also been released in the female part, those two would definitely meet. And when the, that happens, uh, the fertilization will happen. And when that fertilization happens in the tube, they will both move into the uterus where the implantation happens and the pregnancy starts to grow. Next slide. So the next slide just basically looks at the fertilization process. So if the egg from the female um, partner and the sperms have met on day zero, they will join together. They will start to move over a few days by day five, we expect that they should implant into the uterus and the pregnancy starts to grow. Next slide. So, so what will be the main, main um, causes of infertility? In the male um, 
side, we look at what are the male factors. So if there are no sperms at all, so the sperms cannot be there in a number of ways. Number one, if for example, the testicles are not able to produce the sperms, then during ejaculation, there won't be any sperms. Or if the tubes where the sperms have to move through is blocked and especially because of infection, then there won't be any sperms that will be released. So again, in terms of the sperms, we also want to look at the quality of the sperms because the sperms carry all the genetic material uh, on the male side. So the, the sperm has got a head, it's got a neck and it's got a tail. All these things have to be normal for them to be able to reproduce and they should be able to move. So we look at the quality of the sperms. If the quality is poor, obviously that will affect um, the, um, the reproduction process. Therefore, the quality can be affected again because of infection. The quality can be affected again because someone is exposed to chemicals or people who drink a lot or people who smoke, all those who affect the, the quality of the, the sperms. When we're looking at the female factors, now, if we go back to that picture in our mind where I showed you all the ovary, the tubes and the uterus, that system has to be complete. So we, uh, we call ovulation as a process where the egg comes from um, the ovary into the tube. If that process doesn't happen, and that can be because, number one, the um, hormones that are supposed to work on the ovaries are not working properly, or the ovaries do not have the eggs to be released, then ovulation will not happen. And that can be due to a number of other diseases. If the tube where the egg is supposed to move is blocked, then again, that process will be affected. The egg will not reach where the sperm is for it to be fertilized. If, for example, fertilization has occurred, but then that fertilization, fertilized um, egg has to be implanted into the uterus, but where it's supposed to be implanted, there is something. So usually things that grow into the uterus are things like fibroids, they will affect the implantation process. So all these can be problems. And we can see here that the problems are both on the male side and the female side. Because when we're talking about infertility, one of the things that has been preached a lot before was like infertility only affects females. But in actual fact, it affects everyone, uh, male and female. And we all look at the, uh, the statistics now. When we're looking at the statistics on the next slide, please. We will understand that um, male fertility almost contributes 30% uh, of the causes. Uh, it's on the next slide, please. Yes, um, and female infertility also contributes 30% of the causes. On both male and female together, they can also have causes that are, amount to about 30%. And in 10% of the couples, at times we don't find the main reason. So those ones we call unexplained infertility and those contribute um, 10%. So if we look at the statistics, it actually shows that both male and female, they are affected equally. And that's something that we also need to try and understand. And when we're spreading out the messages, people need to know that even um, um, males are affected as equally as females are. Next slide, please. So this is just the same um, uh, on the next slide, please. Yes, it's just um, a, a graph that is showing the same um, uh, numbers that I've already explained. Uh, next slide, please. Now, when we now go to say, what are the treatment options that are there? And here I'll just speak basically in terms of what we, um, we look at when we're talking about treatment. First of all, it is important that we understand what would be the problem. So we ask both the male partner and the female to come together to the clinic for us to search and find what could be the cause. And when we do find the cause, um, then we institute what could be the treatment. And most of the times what we do is we ask them to go to the lab for blood tests and there we're looking for 
hormones on both male and female side. We want to look for signs of any infection on both sides. They'll be asked to go for a scan, especially in the female side, where we're looking now at how the ovaries are looking like. We want to look at how the uterus looks like. There are other imaging techniques that we use where we want to look at how the tubes are in terms of uh, whether they're open or they've been blocked. In the male side as well, there are certain scans that we actually do where we want to see if any of the tubes where the sperms have to move has also been, um, been blocked. But we can understand that the major causes um, of, um, of infertility on both the male and the female side, as I slightly highlighted, are due to infections. And most of these infections come in because of sexually transmitted infection. And unfortunately, in women and times when they have been performing unsafe abortion, that can lead to infection in the reproductive system, and that can affect uh, the uterus, but it can also affect um, the tubes that they can be blocked. Or at times when they've delivered and it has been un, um, not properly managed, they can also get infection after the delivery. And those are the things that would affect later on uh, their chances of um, of conceiving. So things uh, that will block the tubes, both in the male and female, will be infections and usually sexually transmitted infection. Um, I've also mentioned that there can be something that can actually be in the uterus itself, especially in the female side, things like fibroids. And I spoke uh, a little bit in terms of how the poor quality sperms um, can come about in the male side and mainly these are things that males are being exposed so things like tobacco smoking tobacco drinking alcohol toxins um, that we know can affect um, the quality of the sperms as well as infection next slide please. so in terms of the main uh, treatment options um, so patients can at times, so for example, if we find that there is an infection, they can be given antibiotics, those they will take, and then we'll test again, especially on the male side, if the sperms have improved. Um, in, in other cases, we give them vitamins, um, which are antioxidants that they have to take, or the injections that they get to try and improve uh, the semen um, quality and the number itself. In that case, um, if there's still some problems, then there are certain medical assisted procedures that we do where we correct the sperms and inject them directly into the, into the eggs um, so that we can try and improve the chances of conceiving. On the female side, if we do find, for example, that there is a blockage um, that, that can be released, um, if there are any fibroids, those can be removed. Um, so that we improve the environment in which the pregnancy has to sit or the passage where the eggs have to go. If, for example, this cannot happen, especially when maybe we can't open the tubes and they're completely blocked, then the process has to be done outside. And that's where you, we talk about medically assisted reproductive systems. So we'll talk about IVF and so on, which will be on the next slide, please. Um, so on the next slide, there are different ways of how we try and improve um, the chances of conceiving. So this is where technology now comes in. The simpler one, which is very common at times, is what we call artificial insemination. Uh, these ones where the, we can use the partner's um, uh, semen or some people can get donation uh, of the semen. Basically, what we want to do is we get the semen and inject it directly into the uterus um, of, the, of the female uh, partner at the correct time when we know that the, or the woman is ovulating, whether she's been given medication or we're just using her natural cycle. But basically, this is to try and improve uh, the number of um, semen that can be deposited into the uterus. Um, we hear a lot nowadays about what we call IVF, and IVF is a very big um, uh, crowd of, of techniques that, that we, we, we look at, but basically what we're trying to do is to um, mimic the process that happens in the woman outside we do it in the lab so what we do is we collect uh, the eggs from the ovaries and then when those have been collected 
we inject with the, with the, with the, with the sperm uh, in the lab and then we start the process of that egg uh, that has been fertilized to start to grow over a period of three to, to, to five days we can see the growth and when that happens now we take it to implant it into the uterus and that works much much better for those that have got maybe sperm problems because basically we need only one sperm to actually do the process or for those women who are have got blocked tubes then they can benefit from from these ones and again so this can these these systems can be used with this the you know um eggs from the same partners or they can get donation in terms of sperms or eggs but again giving them a, a chance of um of conceiving we should just be aware that these uh, um, these processes have got a lot of legal and medical uh, ethics issues and so um, couples have to be counseled fully about what what they can they can access and what they should expect and what is allowed in each and every setting Okay, next slide, please. Now, having understood that infertility affects both male and female, why is it that women are the ones that are actually being uh, stigmatized when it comes to, uh, to female? And we tend to understand that this comes in because of a lot of old ideas that have been around where people say that uh, from the Bible, it actually said that the woman is gonna bear in pain. So that's why. Um, all these women are being exposed to a lot of stigma. Um, and the word Stella is mainly referring to, it's, it's a feminine word. And so therefore women are being put uh, under a lot, of, um, uh, a lot of pressure. And we understand that in the community, most of the times, if the woman is childless, then she's not, she's not a woman at all, is not considered as a, as a woman. Um, at all and most of the times they would be actually considered to be replaced you can go and find another woman who will be able to um to 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 give birth uh, to to a child so all these are some of the things that we understand have been there and they've been perpetuated in our communities and that affect uh, a lot of women than men because of these old ideas and the next slide actually also looks at you know, the poor knowledge that most of the communities have when it comes to infertility. Like I mentioned, but probably for most of you, you didn't even know that 30% of the men are actually affected. And when we're looking at equality, 50% um, is being contributed by male factors and 50% by female, both of them have got an equal chance of having problems. Um, so, so we, 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 we know that most of the communities don't understand the goal with this media training is to make sure that we provide the correct information uh, so that people know that men can also be affected as equally as, 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 as females. Um, and it's been a big problem for most men to actually go to, um, to the hospital to, to seek for medical help. We want to encourage when it comes to issues of infertility that both um, the, the male and female come together to the, for the consultation, especially the first consultation to try and understand what could be the, 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 the main problem. The other things is because we've got we don't we don't have really specialized um, services where people can access um, infertility treatment. So because of the poor management that has affected um, us in terms of providing the correct information as well to 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 um, to the communities. And when women come to uh, to to for consultation, usually they don't speak much about uh, their, their problems at times. So they've got a very low purchasing power when it comes to uh, consultation. Um, and again, when we look at how our health systems are, it, it is because of lack of, you know, um, specialized or trained people when it comes to infertility. And that's one goal why Make Foundation is there to try and improve, you know, um, the training for healthcare workers in each and every institution for them to understand issues about infertility and provide um, the best care that they can. I'll show you in the next slide um, some of the things that we, 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 we've seen in terms of the, the pyramid when it comes to health seeking behavior in, in, in terms of in, in infertility.
This slide just highlights some of the major problems that uh, we face when we, it comes to, to infertility. Number one, we know, like in our region, sub-Saharan region or in, the, in, in, in Africa, that we've got very high rates of um, um, infertility and the issues of stigma that we're trying to break through this uh, media training today um, is, is very high in, in, in our society. And the lack of very qualified medical staff in most of the institutions that provide um, health care uh, for, for, for our patients, we don't have those qualified medical staff. But I can tell you that Make Foundation is tried and um, we're trying to try and train as many people as we can in each and every country so that at least people can be able to access good quality um, medical treatment when it comes to, uh, to infertility and trying to establish specialized centers because they're not enough in most of the, uh, of the, uh, of the countries. And again, the, the treatment itself is very expensive. Um, so, so, so we want to try and bring it down by providing or the communities can, can, can have qualified people around that they can get um, help from. And these situations are similar in almost all the countries um, in Africa. Now I talked about the pyramid, which is in the next slide. I just want you to, to try and understand that when, when we live in a community, people, first of all, they go to the first level of care, which are the people that they trust. And these are traditional leaders. These are birth attendants and so on. That's where they'll go and seek help. And then when they move up the ladder, that's where the next probably person that they will meet will be a medical assistant or it will just be a general practitioner or a midwife who has some kind of knowledge when it comes to infertility. Then the very highest level is where you're meeting specialists or consultants uh, in, in, in obstetrics and gynecology or in infertility. Um, but those are at a very high uh, level and at times they cannot be accessed by most of the people from the community because of lack of resources or you know, financial issues and all that. Um, the next slide actually will show us the timeline that it would probably take for someone to reach that highest level where they're meeting a specialized um, person when it comes to infertility for them to get the good quality treatment that they need. You can imagine it may, so if someone else, for example, was 20 years old, by the time they're 40, that's when they will have, have managed to reach um, a specialist. And at that time, some of the things have, have actually changed in their life. And now they would want now to be going for IVF and so on. What we want to try and encourage here is number one, that we provide with the best care that we can, even in the communities by training most of the health workers. Um, in terms of infertility, so that the access should start even in the ground level, where level one, where people um, can access it as easily as possible. You guys in the media play a vital role in that level one, because people trust you guys. People understand the things that you talk to them each and every day. And if you provide them with the correct information, and especially here, the drive is to make sure that both male and female partners come to the clinic. They should be seen by a qualified doctor. A doctor should be able to do some test and investigation, provide the treatment that they need. If they can't, they'll be able to move them up the ladder to the next level. And most of the times, so that's where the, you, they refer to a specialist who would do the other treatment options that I was talking about, things like IVF and so on. But you can see from this that it takes long years for some people to actually reach the last level of, um, of treatment, which is a specialized kind of treatment. We want to try and reduce that gap by providing, number one, the quality or rather the correct information in the community through you, health, um, through you uh, the media guys, to try and motivate for, for, for couples to be able to unveil themselves to come to the clinics so that they should be able to access the, the, the information or to access the treatment that they can get so that these years are actually reduced. This ladder shouldn't be too much for them. So your role, guys, is to try as much as possible to provide the correct information. And when they get to the hospital, Make Foundation is trying as much as they can to train 
as many uh, health workers as we can, medical doctors who can be specialized in this, so that most people are able to um, to get the quality um, uh, treatment that they will need when it comes to infertility. Next. So how do we then fight against the stigma in women? This comes in because we, we, we can do this through education at all levels. And we, with this media training, this is the level that we started where the media, you guys have got a vital role in spreading the information, teaching people what are the correct things. Um, so it is important that at all levels, media, whether it is in, in, in our church leaders, whether traditional leaders, that's, those are the people that have to, to train, to be trained or to be educated about the correct information that they have to give um, to, to, to their communities. We want to make sure that the adults um, and the young people actually know and understand about infertility and that infertility affects both male and female. So that can break the stigma around um, uh, infertility, uh, mainly in, in, in women. We want to make sure, like I said, that you, the media, have got a major role when it comes to spreading this, this information. We want to involve civil society leaders and even our, you know, our, our public authorities, you know, our traditional leaders and all those so that they understand what infertility is all about. And if they've got the correct information, that can help us to try and break the stigma around women. So that was the first part of my um, presentation. Um, the next part will probably be just to try and look at what um, preventative measures are there. And these are simple things that we can try and, and encourage people in the communities to do. And what... what... Okay, the, so the next slide um, basically outlines my next um, pre presentation, which will look at infertility prevention. It will look at um, the link between infertility and um, infectious diseases. And mainly, I just wanted to concentrate more on male infertility and how that can help us to break the stigma around um, infertility. So the next slide, um, the next one. Okay. So the next one um, basically tries to make us understand that here in Africa, some of the traditions that, uh, that we practice um, and cultural practices that we have or religious beliefs that we have combined with the poor resource environment that we live in, this has been linked um, to high levels of preventable causes of infertility. Things like, you know, untreated sexually uh, transmitted diseases, which can lead to tubes being blocked, you know, unsafe abortion, um, things like poor nutrition, um, consequences of infection um, that comes in, especially because of the traditional practices around female um, genitalia mutation. Uh, those will cause, you know, infection in mainly in the in the in the reproductive system for for females, and exposure to things like smoking, um, lead, petrol another environmental pollutant these will affect the quality of sperms and so on the next slide please now we know that in sub-sahara africa the most common cause of infection i mean the most common cause of infertility is infection it contributes to about 95 percent especially in women uh, if we compare that to the other countries um, in the developed countries, which is around 33%. Now, these untreated infections are the ones that will lead to infection. I mean, will lead to infertility, both in males and females. Um, so what we try and encourage here is to make sure that people regularly go for checkups. Um, they should seek medical help to try and see if they've got any infection and that can be treated uh, properly. The next slide now specifically looks at some of these um, infections. My slide, yes, I'll just, before I move to that slide, 
My slide looks at um, issues of pelvic inflammatory disease. So these, inf these are infections that are specific to the female uh, reproductive system. And the common ones are chlamydia and gonorrhea. And unfortunately, these sexually transmitted diseases, they do not produce a lot of symptoms. We only see the complications that they will bring in. So things like tubes being blocked. Uh, some people will complain about chronic pain uh, throughout um, their lives. But we want these to be picked up very early so and treated correctly. So people need to seek medical help. The, the safest way that we can try and also do this in the community is people to practice safe sex. So we are educating people to try and understand that there can be some diseases that may not be showing much signs. They need to be having regular checkups. But also, it is also better to practice um, self sex. The, the, the next slide where we were talking about HIV infection, this one, we know that in our, in our population in, in the sub Saharan Africa, HIV is very common. And that has been linked to um, also causing a lot of uh, issues when it comes to, to, to infertility, things like weight loss and because you've been chronically ill that can affect the hormones that are being produced and some people find it very difficult to to conceive because of just having the the, the hiv infection but also linked to that is the fact that we have pelvic inflammatory disease that also come up so all these can affect um, both male and female, but in the female part, issues of irregular, you know, having irregular periods uh, or not being able to ovulate can be uh, because of HIV itself. Now, again, when it comes to HIV, the main focus is prevention. The main focus is people to have safe sex and people should be educated when it comes to that. Okay. The next slide just emphasizes again, both male and female should practice self-sex when it comes to preventing sexually transmitted infection. Right, what are some of then the things that a woman can be encouraged or strategies that can increase the chances of becoming pregnant? Number one, we encourage that women should have moderate um, exercises. We know that if you've got too much, if you do too much exercise, that can also cause some hormonal changes. That's why we're saying this has to be um, moderate exercises that will actually increase the chances of one conceiving. Next slide, please. We want to also to encourage that people should be able to eat a well-balanced diet and maintain their weight to a normal um, weight. They shouldn't be uh, underweight, they shouldn't be overweight because underweight and overweight, we also know that will affect, especially in the females, the the quality or the, it will affect their periods. So if you eat a well um, balanced diet, you, you live a healthy life, you would have a good weight that should be able to allow you to increase your chances of um, conceiving. The next slide looks at some of the things that can um, be prevented. So we ask women to quit smoking because that can also affect them. Those that drink alcohol, we wanted to try and, and encourage them to avoid drinking alcohol. And those that use drugs, we also encourage them to stop using um, um, drugs. We also, on the next slide, try to uh, encourage women to limit the amount of caffeine um, that they're taking. The next slide will talk about um, things that we should also avoid. So we know that there's some industrial and environmental toxins that also can affect um, the, 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 the female reproductive system. Therefore, these things should be avoided if one wants to conceive uh, so that we can increase the chances of conceiving. The other key thing is the stress that comes in because of, you know, maybe planning and when it's usually very difficult to conceive, the, the woman will be under stress and usually that will affect um, the, their hormones in the body and that reduces the chances of conceiving. Therefore, we encourage if 
they can reduce or avoid things that are stressing them much so that their hormones can be working well and be able to increase the chances of conceiving. Now we want to raise an awareness uh, on the next slide um, in terms of um, um, about male infertility. Because like I said, it is very important to know that 50, among 30% of the causes of um, infertility are due to male factors. And there have been so many um, things that have been said about um, males not being fed in, not having problems and so on. We want to say that males are very, very important when it comes to re reproduction. Um, and we know that men can play a very vital role when it comes to um, to improving uh, the chances of conceiving in, 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 a, in a family. The next slide, therefore, we're trying to encourage men to come together when it comes to trying to conceive that a man and a woman should support each other and they should be able to come to their clinic together so that they can get help. Men should be informed that it is also them that can have a problem um, therefore they should be coming together with their partners um, to the clinic for a checkup as well as for them to know if they need any information uh, so that they can have um, a better chance of um, of conceiving so Danny, when it comes to um, treatment for infertility both men and women should come together. They should support each other um, so that they can increase um, the chances of, um, of conceiving. The next slide. Now, I just want to speak specifically now on the male infertility. What, what, what are the things that could be happening? So in the pictures that I saw, I showed you in the beginning, there could be a problem um, to do with the blockage of the tubes. And that could be something that could come in because of infection or some men are born with some tubes that are not there. So therefore, the semen may not be able to be produced or to be delivered outside. So this could be something that you're born with or something that you acquire, you acquire through infection, for example, that will lead to, to, to the tubes to be blocked. And at times you may not, a, a man may not have um, uh, hormones that are able to produce uh, the, the semen in the testicles. So there could be a hormonal problem. Therefore, this could lead to semen not being produced at all. And then a man can also be uh, exposed to uh, environmental factors. This could be things like drugs, alcohol, or uh, industrial waste. But again, another important thing is temperature. A higher temperature would affect the quality of the sperms that are being produced. The body itself has been made in a certain way that the testicles are in a well-moderated environment. Now, if men are exposed to too much uh, uh, temperature, that will affect the quality of the uh, sperms that are being produced. Therefore, temperature control I'll show you on, on, on the other slides that are coming up, what are the things that, you know, probably increase the temperature and that can affect um, the temperature on the testicles and that can affect uh, the quality of, um, of the sperm. And one other things, again, like in the women, we encourage that people should have a well-balanced diet and they should maintain um, their weight and they should live a healthy uh, life. Next slide, please. Now, so what are the things that men can also avoid um, so that at least they should be able to have um, uh, better chances of conceiving? The next slide, please. So on the next slide, we're looking at some of the healthy tips that we can give men. So things like limiting the alcohol intake, reducing the, um, uh, the, the, the drugs um, that um, one can be uh, exposed or uh, stopping smoking, um, the temperature things, these are the things. So we know in our catches down here, we normally like to be on a motorcycle uh, that has got 
the engine that can can affect the temperature on the testicles we want to try and avoid you know increasing the temperatures there so that the sperms can be produced nicely um, we want to encourage regular uh, exercises and to re to avoid being exposed to an industrial um, uh, things uh, and also to um, eat a well-balanced diet and maintaining a healthy um, lifestyle. So in conclusion, the key message here is that infertility is not a stigma. Infertility affects both male and females equally. Um, and we should get important information that we need to give to uh, the community at large. And for, for men, we try and encourage them to support their wives when it comes to uh, fertility treatment. And it is a shared responsibility between men and, and, and women, but also I think the community at large, we need to play a better role in trying to, um, to support the couples that are infertile. Um, and um, to make sure that uh, men um, uh, uh, and, and women um, have um, a, a child. And the most important message again is men are more than fathers and women are more than mothers. Some of these are just the hashtags that we're using uh, for Make Foundation. Um, uh, you can go through them um, and that will mark the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lugano. Uh, very insightful uh, conversation there. Um, if you have any question, please feel free to ask us in the chat and uh, you can type uh, your, your question, even if you are asking French, we'll be able to translate that for you. Again, for the benefit of uh, those who are joining us, go to the more tab on the bottom uh, right corner of your screen and activate the language that you prefer. Um, just to, to give you some context, Dr. Lugano has uh, completed his fertility training, which was provided by Mac Foundation from India uh, in 2019. He uh, presently is pursuing a postgraduate diploma in sexual and reproductive medicine uh, through uh, another scholarship that is provided by Mac Foundation. Thank you so much, Dr. Lugano. I can't Thank wait you. to come to Namibia uh, when all of this is done. And of course, uh, uh, when the questions come in, uh, please be on hand to answer some of them. Uh, let's now move on to uh, Dr. Trisha Tori. She is the director of uh, pra Prashant IVF Clinic and Information Center in Mauritius. She's a highly respected and experienced fertility professional with sound clinical knowledge uh, over a seven year period. She also acquired experience as an andrologist and she has a lot of knowledge uh, about the new high technologies in infertility management and counseling skills. Uh, Dr. Trisha uh, will be speaking on uh, infertility as a growing problem in Mauritius, some of the factors that are causing this the lifestyle and the role of media in reaching out to the communities uh, uh, and raising awareness on this. Uh, Dr. Uh, Turi, welcome. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for welcoming me on this platform. Thank you for the Merck Foundation. So I'm Dr. Trisha, and today uh, I'll be talking mostly about the infertility, which is a growing concern in Mauritius. So uh, we've got the slide. So infertility, it is a growing problem in Mauritius. And uh, mostly I'll be explaining about the factors and the different lifestyles Influ influencing fertility. We'll see about the ways to optimize fertility also, and uh, we'll talk briefly about the role of the media in Mauritius to reach out to the communities and raising awareness. So next. Uh, so we as clinicians, we are often asked to provide advice about the sexual and lifestyle practices that can help conception to optimize the best chance of having a baby. So yeah. here, this 
presentation will be mainly uh, taking reference from a community opinion from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. The different questions that we are often asked as doctors are, mm. when to get pregnant? What should I try? When should I try to have sex? Can I smoke when trying to conceive? Can I have consume alcohol? Can I take caffeine? How much cups of coffee we can take when trying to conceive? Should we have sexual intercourse on a regular daily basis? And also, one more important question is about the use of lubricants when trying to conceive. So, next slide. We'll briefly go through the definition of fertility. The fertility is the capacity to produce a child, and whereas infertility, it is the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse. And it affects approximately 12 to 15 percent of couples, and it is an increasing trend in Mauritius. So next, thank you. Fertility is the highest in the first three months of unprotected intercourse. So approximately 80 percent of the couples will conceive in the first six months when attempting pregnancy. And this relative fertility is decreased by half among women in the late 30s as compared to women in the early 20s. So that's something we should know about. The better, the, it's better to conceive earlier than wait for after 30. So the effects of age are more pronounced in, men, in women than men. Women fertility declines after 35 years old. Well, in men, it may show there's a slow decline in fertility, but is, it is significant only after 50 years old. That's a bit unfair. I mean, it has been unfair to ladies. So this is a graph showing about the fertility and aging process. As it shows, as a lady grows uh, towards the 35 years old, the fertility rate drastically decreases. Yes, it is possible for women after 35 years old to conceive, but they have to seek, most probably they have to seek for medical help. So next slide. The first question that is often asked about the frequency of intercourse. There's a very misperception that the longer the abstinence period, there will be more sperms and that will be better for conception. And that's false. In abstinence of more than five days, it affects the sperm count negatively. A shorter abstinence period of two days is associated with better sperms. And the probability to conceive is highest when a couple is trying to have intercourse every one to two days. Yes. So many people tend to monitor their ovulation to know when to have intercourse. For this, we have different uh, methods that are used. Well, clinically, it is about the follicular monitoring with ultrasounds and all, but the uh, methods that are used by the population is normally about assessment of the cervical mucus or vaginal secretion. The ovulation kits are there to measure the LH surge. LH is a hormone that increases just during, just at the time of the ovulation. The other things that they can monitor, the temperature changes, they are the mood changes, and that is the libido. But that's a bit confusing at times and the people need to have proper uh, information on how to proceed. The best chances to conceive is when intercourse occurs one to two days prior to ovulation. So next slide. This is another belief that there need to be ovulation and then the patient starts trying to conceive. That's false. Trying to conceive should occur before ovulation. As shown in the graph, on the day of ovulation, the 
graph already, the chances of pregnancy already tend to be decreasing. It is maximum two days prior to ovulation. So for that, the patient needs to get proper counseling, proper advice from the doctor to help them know when they are ovulating. So next slide. Now about the coital practices. Well, there are some beliefs that coital positions affect the fecundability, which is not true. There is also no relationship between orgasm and fertility. And some lubricants, they, yes, they affect fertility as they inhibit the sperm motility. And these include the kiwi jelly, the saliva and olive oils. Fortunately, the mineral oils, canola oils and some hydroxyethyl cellulose based lubricants are recommended and they do not affect the sperm motility. Next slide, please. Now about the diet and lifestyle. The diet, the pro-fertility diet consists mainly of uh, folic acid intake. We have to have a better intake of folic acid, vitamin B12, vitamin D, which is very essential. And in the Mauritian population, we have many people are vitamin deficient. The omega-3 is an important uh, factor. And we should opt for uh, low pesticide fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and mainly seafood and poultry. So what is recommended is a healthy, well-balanced diet. And we recommend less of carbohydrates, more of fruits, vegetables, proteins, and all. Other thing is about the body weight and exercise. Well, fertility decreases in obese women, as we all know. As the BMI of the patient goes up, the fertility chances to conceive decreases. But it also decreases when the patient is very thin. So a very low BMI of less than 18 kg per meter square shows that fertility decreases. In case of men, so it is obesity is linked to low sperm concentration and most importantly about the abnormal sperm morphology, that is a form of the sperms. They are distorted in male patients with obesity. What we recommend is that to have an exercise of at least 30 minutes of moderate exercise, like Dr. Lugano said previously, we should not go for very intense exercise and it should be at least three to four times per week, but that should be regular. Thank you. And the uh, second, the lot, lot, ne next effect about the smoking. It is clear cut that smoking affects fertility. Yes, it decreases the chances of pregnancy. It affects both the female and the male. And also it increases the risk of miscarriage. Secrets have also shown that uh, they tend to, women who smoke tend to have the menopause about one to four years earlier than the women who should who are not smoking. In the men, smoking decreases the density, that is the quantity of the sperm, and also the motility, the quality. Two things, the quantity and the quality of the sperms, and both should be optimum to be able to conceive. Other things like vaping, uh, electronic cigarettes are also to be avoided. Cannabis is to be avoided in both men and women who are trying to conceive. Next slide, please. As for the alcohol intake, well, we still have limited evidence, but uh, the papers till now have shown that more than two drinks per day increases the risk of infertility as compared to less than one drink a day. So a couple trying to conceive can have one drink a day. So one drink, one peg, we can say a day. That's better. And uh, whereas for women, well, surprisingly, it has seen that uh, women who can see, who trying to conceive and they're consuming wine has a slightly better uh, chances to conceive than those who are not consuming wine. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, um, now about caffeine. Caffeine consumption should be less than uh, five cups per day. So what we recommend is only one to two cups. And this has no apparent adverse effect on the fertility or pregnancy outcomes. Whereas in men, the caffeine consumption has not shown to have any effect on semen parameters. Next slide, please. Next, yeah, thank you. Now we'll be talking about the environmental toxins, which is very, very important. Many people trying to conceive are affected, uh, the sperm counts or the oocyte quality are affected by environmental toxins. It can be in the form of dry cleaning agents, chemicals in the printing industries, pesticides, heavy metal exposures. Here locally in Mauritius, we see many people working uh, like drivers who are sitting for long hours, uh, bakers exposed to uh, heat. We have some painters, carpenters, mechanics, all these. We have seen many effects of uh, the environmental toxins on the sperms. So it doesn't directly affect the uh, quantity of the sperm, but affects the quality of the sperms. So the morphology is affected, the sperm's forms tend to change, and ultimately they lead to low motility. The sperms cannot move as it should be and cannot ascend up to the fallopian tube for fertilization. That's why it causes a decreased fertility. And uh, this, uh, we should also understand that the exposure of environmental toxins affect the DNA of these sperms. The sperm's DNA, once affected, they can lead to decreased chance of conception or increased chances of miscarriage. Similarly, in a lady who have been exposed to environmental toxins for a long period of time, will experience, can have chances of experiencing uh, increased risk of miscarriage because of the poor quality of the oocytes. So next uh, will be about the factors, just a brief overview about how it is important to take care of these factors. But obesity has seen that uh, it impacts fertility as it increases the time to conception by twofold. This is in case of obesity, underweight increases the time to conception by fourfold. So it's not good to be too slim also. So smoking, smoking has a relative uh, risk of infertility increased by 60%, whereas alcohol, that is more than two drinks per day, increases the relative risk of infertility by 60% too. Caffeine, more than 250 milligrams per day, that is more than two to three cups per day. It decreases the fecundability by 45%. The use of illicit drugs increases the re relative risk of infertility by 70%. And the toxins, exposure, and solvents increases the relative risk of infertility by 40%. Next slide, please. So uh, we'll see about the role of media in uh, reaching out to the communities and raising awareness. So what we expect from the media is locally in Mauritius to put more influence on the different treatments available. First of all, here, we, there's still a stigma associated with infertility. We're still having patients who are not aware of the fertility problems, they are not aware of uh, their reproductive system, and they still consider it as a taboo to talk about it. This is the main difficulty that we are having. Once these patients are ready to accept to get information and get advice from a fertility doctor, that's get better. So we just need, we need the media to help in making the people know that Yes, we have treatments available for fertility. It is not that once you're, uh, you have infertility issues, 
you will, the, for the whole of your life, you won't be able to conceive. No, we have different treatments. So that's very important that we provide essential information to break the different misconceptions. We have to raise awareness about the availability that, like I told you. And the uh, other thing is about educating the people, mostly at a very young age. At times, people tend to ask for medical help only after 35, 32 years old. Now with the, uh, the generation that is the working population, many people don't even think about uh, conceiving before the age of 30. The working ladies only after 33, 35, then they'll go trying to conceive and that's a bit late. Like I told you, 35 years old, the fertility tend to start decreasing. So we need to sensitize the youngsters mainly. There are different infertility myths that are associated. And five more important, the most important infertility myth is, first of all, about the frequent ejaculation decreases male infertility, male fertility, sorry. So in the population, we tend to believe that if we have frequent intercourse, uh, the male fertility is decreasing. And I've seen many patients like that. So uh, this is to be broken. It's not true. Like I told you, at least one or two, uh, ejac one to, uh, ejaculation every one to two days is recommended. So the second uh, uh, myth is about, so the second myth is about the exact timing of ovulation. People, like I told you, they tend to have intercourse after ovulation, but it is best to have intercourse just between the end of the period and the middle of the cycle, that is when the ovulation occurs. Other false belief is that about lying in bed with your legs up, having, trying to conceive. No, there's no, that's not true. The fourth one about the long-term use of oral contraceptive pills causes infertility. That's also not true. There may be a delay in the uh, cycle coming back to normal, but there's no evidence that it causes infertility. And uh, the other myth that uh, is there, we people tend to uh, wait for long, only after one year or more of trying, then they will ask for help. That we should encourage people to uh, ask for help, ask for advice, get the test done, get them th themselves investigated, even at a very early stage. So uh, why not just after the marriage or even prior to that, at the age of 30, we can get the test done. Next slide, please. Uh, I would also like to focus on two very important conditions that are prevailing mostly in Mauritian population. This is firstly the endometriosis and secondly is the polycystic ovarian syndrome. I won't be too long on that. Uh, it will be a brief, uh, only briefly telling you about this. So next slide. How about endometriosis? Well, what is endometriosis? Maybe we have heard about the term and uh, they, we all know that it is associated with infertility. What it is, Actually, it is that cells that resemble the uterine lining, that is the endometrial cells. They don't just grow in the uterus, but they have moved outside and are growing outside the uterus. So these patients will complain of uh, very painful menses. It can start from a very young age, right, uh, 16, 17. They'll have uh, painful menses where they will need to take painkillers or else they impair their daily activity. Gradually, this intensity increases and the patient will present with, the, the lady will present up with pelvic pain and uh, will start having painful intercourse. Eventually, it goes up to impairing the bowel movement, painful uh, bowel, painful urination. So uh, in this case of endometriosis, we often see that women ask for help uh, only in the later stage. 
So only after they are having very painful menses, painful intercourse that is impairing the life, then they will come and seek for medical help. This should, we should educate the people about that. A painful mens, painful uh, menses, even at a very young age, is to be investigated. And endometriosis, if we know of that early, we diagnose that early, we can give the appropriate treatment and get the patient to avoid having issues of fertility. So the second, next slide, please. The second uh, condition uh, I would like to talk about is the polycystic ovary. This is also a growing issue in the population, Mauritian population. And here the lady will present with irregular menses, with excess hormones, androgen hormones, so that is they will have excess facial hair, male pattern bonus, and they will grow with uh, obesity ultimately leading to insulin resistance and diabetes mellitus. This also, in this group of patients, we tend to see that they seek help only after the after long, after many years of uh, irregular medicines. And at that time, when we clinicians, we look at the patient, uh, it's we, are, we find ourselves in a very uh, difficult position asking the patient to have to reduce their weight, maybe the BMI gone above 35 kg per meter square. And we have to ask them to go for weight loss, dietary modifications, and a proper healthy lifestyle. So the role of media here for the polycystic ovary is maybe we can educate the very young group patients, so 16, 17, uh, even younger than that, about the need for exercise, regular exercise, the need for a proper diet, and the need for a proper lifestyle to prevent the problem of polycystic ovary. Because yes, polycystic ovary causes infertility, and thus this should be dealt with. The other factor that uh, I would like mainly uh, to talk about the problems of infertility in Mauritius. Well, like Dr. Lugano said, we have uh, different uh, treatments available, but we are limited in Mauritius. We don't have the sperm donor program, we don't have the USAI donor program, and most importantly, the surrogacy. We have limited destinations for patients who are willing for surrogacy. This is something that maybe we should uh, deal with that. Uh, better afterwards. With this, uh, I just come to an end of my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Tricia. Very insightful. And uh, I see already questions uh, here. Um, and uh, let me quickly ask you a question before we uh, invite our next speaker. You have a question. Can a young teenager be diagnosed as infertile? Uh, sorry, I couldn't get you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, there's a question here. Can a young teenager be diagnosed as infertile from Neil Siran? Well, infertility, we, it, uh, like I told you, it is only after one year of trial with unprotected intercourse. So then we can term the patient as infertility. So we can't term a teenager who is not sexually active as infertile. But we can at least uh, know about the factors. Like uh, we can spot that the eating habit is not good. The, 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 that, that girl is tending to gain weight. The menses are irregular. So we just give the proper advice at this stage so that we don't find infertility in the coming years. Maybe I answered your question. Okay. Uh, I hope you have another question. If a patient is diagnosed as infertile with proper treatment, what are, what are the chances for them to be fertile again? Well, it is a case-to-case -case base, uh, depending on what... Uh, we, have, we have a very good response with fertility treatment. Most 
most people, if they have, they are not, we are not talking about serious health issues like block tubes or uh, isospermia, that is no sperms. But if we are talking only about uh, like polycystic ovary, uh, hormonal disbalance and uh, some uh, changes that need to be made, the patient can, we can conceive naturally after the proper advice, the proper uh, changes and med med medication that is given. Only patients who have uh, like block tubes, completely bilateral block tubes, uh, complete isospermia or advanced stage of endometriosis, then they should ask for help for advanced uh, fertility treatment like the IVF. IVF, it is not recommended for all the patients. Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Tricia. That uh, more questions will be coming. Uh, okay, thank you. Yes, uh, you can actually uh, have some of those questions answered. I see Dr. Lugano has already answered some of those questions that were asked by Ashok and Neil. So feel free to keep asking those questions. And now, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on to our next speaker, let me uh, welcome the CEO of Mac Foundation and uh, President of Mac foundation more than a mother, uh, Senator Dr. Russia, uh, to talk to us about the importance of women empowerment through girls' education and the responsible role of media during this pandemic. Dr. Russia, good to see you. Welcome. Thank you very, very much. And thank you very much for our distinguished speakers. Uh, it was really uh, uh, amazing and very informative uh, lectures. And uh, thank you for all the attendees and our uh, media representative and our partner, Mauritius Media Trust, uh, for having this uh, uh, to come together and uh, to have some of your valuable time to attend this. Our uh, first uh, Merck Foundation Health Media Training with the aim to empower women uh, in general, uh, girls in education, uh, breaking the stigma of infertility, empowering infertile or childless women uh, through access to information and health awareness and change of mindset. So because together uh, we believe, I personally and Merck Foundation in general believe very much in the critical role of uh, media and art, uh, soft skills that it is really soft powers, that it is really uh, can create a culture shift and to be the voice of the voiceless and to break the silence about very sensitive uh, health and social issues, that it is very difficult to uh, um, address in community and needs to sensitize the communities about it step by step until they understand it and comprehend it and tolerate it. So as you know, that stigma of infertility is a cultural issue, a social issue, that it is always in many cultures in Africa and other countries, uh, they think that uh, the, the, the only person to be blamed is women, are women. And the women, if, she, if the couple do not have or delayed a bit in having a child, so the only person who blamed is a, are, is a woman. And uh, some other uh, uh, culture, they, yes, they know that it is a responsibility, shared responsibility, 50%, 50% women, and men could be the man the reason, or uh, the woman or the wife is the reason, uh, but uh, still they put pressure on, on, on them. They uh, create this pleasure, uh, pressure and uh, uh, that it is um, uh, resulted in uh, uh, discrimination and mistreatment, uh, uh, domestic violence, uh, uh, many other uh, uh, bad habits we are uh, advocating against every day. But infertility, especially in Africa, uh, it's 85% um, of cases of infertility can be prevented because it's due to untreated infectious diseases, uh, due to child marriage, genital mutation, unsafe abortion, unsafe delivery, uh, a little bit of awareness. And also 50% uh, 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 of uh, uh, the causes of infertility due to male factor or female factor. So they are, they should actually encouragement to speak up and to 
to support their families and their wives to to make a, a very uh, happy uh, family uh, so they can go to sit together they can go to the doctor together and support her emotionally and psychologically and most important, we cannot just only blame men, but of course the mother-in-law and sister-in-law always keep pressure on the wife. Uh, when you will have the child, uh, no, go and marry someone else, uh, leave her, she cannot have children. All this we need to stop. And it cannot be stopped only through media. Media who enter every house without invitation. So we can always have stories uh, so people can see and touch this, this suffering of, of, of uh, uh, infertile women and infertile couples in general. And they understand that what they are doing, it hurts them and affects them. And it should, it should not happen and it is incorrect. And of course, also adding some information in that it's a condition and can be managed and, and it's, a, a, it's not a stigma, it's not a taboo. And women are more than just mothers and men are more than just fathers they can be successful independent uh, society members adding value, value uh, to life and to society and not only to bring children yes of course it's uh, an important uh, uh, role uh, in life but it's not the only thing so women should have their career, they have their life, and if, if they have children, it's okay. If they don't have children, it's okay as well. They should be treated properly and, and respected and valued as an uh, independent and um, a strong member in society. Uh, this is also, in, when we say women are more than mothers, not only for women who cannot have children, even for mothers, for the women who has children, they are more than just mothers. They have their lives, they have their career, they have the contribution to society, to their families, to other families, to uh, uh, to their work. So this is also something very, very important. So more than fathers, the same uh, for men as well. So we have also created uh, the uh, campaign, which is more than fathers, because we want also to encourage men to uh, think that they are more than just fathers and to uh, support their wives and respect women in general. So doing that, uh, we said, we let's create this uh, uh, media training uh, uh, concept. Uh, and we are implemented in many countries in Africa, almost 22 countries in Africa. And because I love Mauritius so much as well. And I've been in Mauritius in 2016. We have an amazing uh, uh, event with UNESCO and the African Union and the uh, government of Mauritius and Minister of Health of Mauritius. Uh, to support uh, and empower women uh, in STEM and young uh, people in STEM. Uh, so it was really amazing. We were very impressed by the country, by the people and their, their enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm to study, to uh, to know more and to, to make a difference. So uh, we had a program uh, with the Ministry of Health of Mauritius, which we're currently um, uh, in, uh, leading and, uh, and executing to uh, uh, provide to 70 one uh, doctor with a scholarship for specialty training with critical and underserved training that is very important for Mauritius healthcare sector, uh, such as diabetes, uh, endocrinology, uh, cardiovascular preventive, respiratory medicine, acute medicine, reproductive and sexual uh, care, which is very much related to what we are talking today. And of course, in addition to pediatric emergency infant, uh, as, um, uh, infant uh, uh, care, uh, neonatal care, uh, orthopedics, uh, internal medicine, uh, gastroenterology, many, many specialties, like 26 specialties, which is going to be great addition because it's a great transformation of the quality care in public uh, healthcare sector. And it will have a really great impact in improving uh, healthcare in, uh, in Mauritius. But also the media training and the role of media is very important. And we have, hence, we have also re announced uh, in partnership with Mauritius Media Trust, our partner, uh, an award of media recognition. The media recognition award is to, uh, if you can, next please, yes. 
Uh, it's one for uh, uh, more than a mother where you write about empowering uh, uh, infertile women, breaking the stigma of infertility and also supporting girls' education. And the other one for uh, making your own, uh, sorry, uh, the other one is uh, uh, mask up with care to also show your, um, your uh, uh, Previous, yes, uh, mask up with care to uh, write about raising awareness about coronavirus uh, in your community and how important to wear the mask, how important to get vaccines, how important it is to, to care to take care of your community through your uh, 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 the, the um, adhering to uh, health and uh, and uh, uh, protection and prevention uh, measures. So this is very important as well, and it will have a really good uh, impact because we know last year it was really amazing. We re we, we launched it in Africa and Latin America and uh, Asia, and it was having a really good uh, response. We have also, in partnership with the Fashion Institute of Mauritius, uh, um, uh, design Fashion Design Institute of Mauritius partnership, Fashion Award for the fashion designers or the fashion student. Uh, so one for also uh, breaking the stigma of infertility and empowering girls in education and infertility in general, uh, empowering fertile uh, women. And the other one, uh, next one, is the mask up with care. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, mask, not mask up with care, make your own mask, which is very important because now we people are doing designs and masks and everything and this can create a, 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 like a, a trend of people to encourage them to wear uh, wear masks and show their creativity the other one for more than a mother for fashion award i want the design to have the the, the messages of of how to break the stigma uh, how women are more than mother in a trendy clothes or a uh, hot couture but it's something that can really uh, uh, Make attention or draw attention to to the message and to the, to the cause. We have done several fashion shows in Zambia and Ghana, and we want to continue across uh, all uh, the continent. And Mauritius, I know they have a very nice style because I always bought new nice things from from Mauritius when I was there. So I said, okay, let us have a creativity and all the talented people to give uh, some addition to uh, uh, helping the cause be the voice of the voiceless in your community in your own setting. We have also Filmmaking Award, uh, which is uh, going to be also with uh, partnership with Mauritius Film Development Corporation, co Corporation. And it's going to be great because people who have, uh, can make films and can make films about the story of infertility and uh, or girls' education. Uh, this is very important too, you know, two very important uh, infertility and girls' education. So it's very important to have the creativity short film or long or documentary or docudrama as you uh, like. And then the, the third one was the music uh, uh, award, which is the song. So we will also uh, people who create songs or music that also help the uh, cause either for empowering girls or education or pregnancy on for baby. These are six awards that we are launching in Mauritius and we're hoping to receive a lot of applications and many talented people either in media or songwriting or music or, or, or uh, filmmaking or fashion design to help the cause and improve the uh, awareness about these important sensitive social and health issues. Uh, also, I want to show you that we have done also a storybook and I want to you and your media uh, also to see if there is any story writers for cartoons and animation in Mauritius that can also contribute to have stories like this one for uh, educating Linda, and this is about supporting girls in education. This one for uh, David's story for uh, um, infertility and how uh, the man supports his wife uh, during the journey of making happy family, how we respect her. You know, it's emphasizing the family values of love and respect. So it's really children's stories, and we would like to have similar to this in uh, in Mauritius. Uh, by Mauritius uh, names and culture and, 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 and things like this. And this is make your own right choice. It's about raising awareness also about uh, uh, coronavirus and uh, through a story of a young man who is um, loyal and honest and so on. So uh, we will share this with you so you can read it. And if you have anyone who can be good in this, it would be great. 
We had also for the fashion, we have created this t-shirt. Uh, it's been uh, designed and this is uh, like beads and been done not in the stigma uh, like this. And uh, this has been uh, done by a group of uh, Thai women in uh, Uganda and in Ghana. So they design it and we give them the, the things and they do it. And this is what I expect from the fashion uh, show. Uh, so now I give you a little bit, I, I give you already a little bit of, you know, overview about what Merck Foundation is doing uh, to um, first transform the healthcare sector uh, and uh, uh, specifically focusing on reproductive care, uh, improving reproductive care and fertility care in, across Africa. We enrolled around 1,100 uh, doctors to these courses, and we are very proud that this will make a revolution in uh, all Africa and will be part of African legacy and part of this 1,100, the 71 for Mauritius. And uh, we have all these initiatives which I talked about, and many, many more. Of course, you, when you go to our website, Mark Foundation website, you will you will know. I'm uh, personally very enthusiastic about this initiative because um, it was my idea, and I wanted to have a strong partnership with media and art and fashion and media specifically because I believe very much in the role, a critical role that media plays to do all these things, and I wish you good luck. And great success in the training to benefit from it and in your coverage to win all the awards and uh, i will be available in our whatsapp group i am available already so if you want to ask me about anything or you want to uh, have me in any kind of uh, interview or something in uh, in your future project to speak about this stuff I am ready as well and looking forward to see you all in person next time. We have to make it in Russia and we have to be in person there. Uh, we're looking forward that this ends and the coronavirus ends uh, soon and we can see each other uh, again like uh, it used to be. Uh, but currently we are online and we will be online until this resolves. Uh, thank you very much and wish you a great luck and all you benefit from, from this course and uh, from our mentorship and benefit from the award already. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Arasha. Uh, good to uh, see Brian, you. Brian, are you going to show them the video? Yes, we are going to uh, show the video. I want to, uh, uh, this video is Jacqueline's story. It's a story of yeah. a, a lady in Kenya that suffered from the stigma of infertility. It's a horrible story. It has a sort of uh, a happy ending, but this story specifically uh, is the main reason why we created this uh, campaign. And it will show you what encourage us to, to come up with this more uh, than a mother uh, campaign. And it will show you also other women that we supported in across Africa. So please, yeah, if you don't mind, uh, Brian, to, to play it. Jacqueline Wende, a 27-year-old young woman from a rural place called Masi in Machakos County, Kenya, tells us her sad story of having both hands chopped off, not by thieves, but by her own husband, for failing to conceive, even though he was the one with a fertility problem. <laughs> Merck Foundation came to the aid of Jacqueline through the Merck More Than a Mother campaign. She was provided with a new home and a supermarket to enable her to earn a steady income and become independent. Like Jacqueline, there are many other women that suffer from infertility stigma. Merck Foundation works closely with partners to empower them to be heroines of more than a mother movement.
Jacqueline, I want to know that you are my sister. As long as I exist in the, this world, mm -hmm. on earth, my fate is connected to you. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand this. You come back to me and anything, I will always be there for you and my room is there. <laughs> so I'm coming. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, inspirational story from Jackie. And, and uh, uh, I was able to go to uh, her home in Nairobi. Really inspirational. We can't wait to uh, be able to uh, visit some of these places again and create uh, the change that we need to do. Dr. Rasha, you want to say something? Yes, uh, the, we, will, we want to make a film, a drama movie about uh, Jacqueline. Actually, we started with, with the writer and the director, Nigerian director, and to start to cast uh, for it, but then Corona came and we stopped. But we uh, think that this is going to be a very uh, good idea of the inspirational movie story. Uh, that can actually contribute very much in addressing this challenge in, in Africa and in close, in close communities as well, because they will see and uh, they will understand that uh, she was not even the one who had a uh, problem of infertility, but the stress and the pressure on the husband uh, caused him to, uh, from after love story, that they, they marry on love story in the university. And then it turned ugly after that. And uh, with the pressure and the, 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 the stress of the community, he turned to be a different person, start to drink and uh, uh, I'll be alcoholic and, and, and aggressive and, and all this. And now he is in prison. So, uh, and she is uh, like you see, you've seen. Uh, so um, I hope this uh, story will contribute to other women and they will, because there are too many Jacqueline in, in Africa. It's only one story, but there is a horrible story similar to this uh, uh, as well. Uh, and as an, an African woman, I know this uh, uh, by heart. So uh, I hope this uh, um, initiatives we are doing and the film we are going to do about Jacqueline will contribute to have no more Jacqueline. So in, in life, I know it will take some time, but we are working with a high speed, especially if you know that uh, we have ambassadors of more than a mother. They are 20 first ladies, African first ladies uh, across Africa. They are doing all the efforts in our partnership with us to be able to uh, uh, address this uh, issue in all uh, communities. Thank you again very, very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rasha. Now, let me invite um, a journalist at Ledefi Media Group and also the vice president at Media Trust uh, Board uh, in Mauritius. Um, she's working as a journalist uh, since, you know, for the past 17 years. And after 10 years in the culture field, she's now a health media expert working uh, on a new digital health media platform. She was selected among the most influential, 100 most influential women in Mauritius. Uh, for the 2017 edition and received the World Women Leadership Award at the fourth World Women Leadership Conference and Awards in India. Uh, Fatima Kaperi is going to talk to us about the important role of media in sensitizing communities about issues like infertility stigma, girls' education, and girls' child marriage. Uh, welcome, Fatima. Today, uh, I'll be speaking about, um, my presentation will be in French, so I, as from now, I'll switch on to French. Uh, donc voilà, bonjour à tous. Donc euh, moi, ma présentation sera surtout euh, autour du rôle des médias, euh, de la conscientisation euh, sur des sujets sensibles, euh, notamment sur la stigmatisation de l'infertilité, l'éducation des filles, euh, le mariage des enfants, la violence liée au sexe et les mutilations génitales féminines. Euh, on va repasser dessus euh, plus tard. Mais dans un premier temps, euh, j'aimerais justement vous parler de l'histoire de la presse euh, mauricienne. Next slide. OK. 
Euh, donc, j'aimerais beaucoup aller de la presse mauricienne qui va bientôt fêter ses 250 ans euh, en 2023. Donc, c'est en 1773 que le premier journal mauricien a été publié. Euh, donc, nous voyons que la presse mauricienne est la plus ancienne euh, dans l'hémisphère sud. Et euh, nous avons eu et nous avons plus de 600 titres euh, qui se sont succédés depuis. Et actuellement, euh, l'un des plus anciens quotidiens euh, qui sort toujours, euh, c'est le Mauricien. Euh, la première fois, c'est sorti en 1908. Et pour revenir un peu sur ce qui nous concerne aujourd'hui autour de la femme, on voit euh, que le premier journal essentiellement féminin a vu le jour en 1822. C'était Annal des Modes. Euh, donc nous voyons qu'au fil des années, euh, la presse a fini par représenter un peu tout le monde, euh, hommes, femmes, euh, je vais plutôt parler des enfants, euh, politiciens, autistes, euh, riches et pauvres. Donc, nous voyons cette évolution au fil des années. Ensuite, euh, donc pour la suite, il y a eu une page féminine euh, qui sortait dans le journal L'Express, c'était à partir de 1963. Et là, euh, nous retrouvons chaque semaine des problèmes de société. Pourquoi je le mentionne ici? Parce que c'est un peu... C'est un peu à partir de là qu'on a pu retrouver les rubriques euh, santé, les problèmes euh, de santé auxquels les femmes faisaient face. Donc, euh, tout ça pour vous dire que voilà, nous avons une presse mauricienne très riche et qui continue d'évoluer. Euh, dans le, la prochaine diaporama, voilà. Voilà. Donc, pour revenir sur le sujet qui nous réunit aujourd'hui, euh, nous voyons qu'il y a de plus en plus de rubriques santé dans les différents journaux euh, qui sont actuellement publiés. Ce sont plus particulièrement euh, des hebdomadaires qui consacrent des colonnes entières à la santé et encore plus ces jours-ci euh, à cause de la COVID-19. Donc, sur l'écran, vous allez voir, nous avons 5 plus, l'hebdo, défi plus, news on Sunday, qui est un des journaux euh, en anglais, anglophone, et l'Express, qui reviennent chaque semaine avec des thématiques différentes, mais qui touchent surtout la santé du Mauricien. Donc là, c'est euh, différent aux pages internationales où il y avait AFP, la situation dans le monde. Ici, c'est vraiment dans le contexte mauricien avec des experts de la santé euh, locaux. Nous retrouvons également un supplément chez L'Express, vous allez voir à gauche sur l'écran. Euh, C'est un supplément que présente L'Express toutes les semaines, qui s'appelle Junior, et qui là euh, vient parler euh, de la santé, des faits de société en général, mais dans un langage très simple pour les Mauriciens, pour les enfants, sorry. Donc là, nous voyons que vraiment la presse fait la part belle à tout le monde, enfants, euh, hommes, femmes, etc. Euh, donc, le prochain, le prochain slide, vous allez voir. Euh, ça ne bouge pas rapidement. The next slide. Donc, euh, le paysage des médias a beaucoup évolué. Nous avons aujourd'hui euh, une série de magazines et de plateformes digitales. Je n'arrive pas à... Voilà. Euh, donc, je vous disais, le paysage des médias a beaucoup évolué. Nous avons aujourd'hui une série de magazines et de plateformes digitales. Donc, mes collègues, euh, plus tard, vont vous parler euh, de la radio et de la télévision. Moi, je vais euh, parler essentiellement des magazines et les web. Donc, euh, vous allez voir sur l'écran à droite, il y a le magazine Essentiel, qui est euh, un magazine de la Mauricienne qu'on ne présente plus ici à Maurice. Et, et sur, à gauche de l'écran, vous allez voir le magazine Santé Plus, Votre Santé Plus, qui est un supplément de business magazine qui vient de... Qui, vient, qui est récent sur le marché, c'est sorti en juin 2021. Et là, on, vient que, on, on voit que justement, il vient répondre à un besoin, euh, celui de savoir où se faire soigner à Maurice. Ensuite, vous allez voir sur l'écran à droite en bas, euh, ça je vais rapidement passer sur le site de Défi Santé, qui est actuellement la seule plateforme média entièrement dédiée à la santé. Vous allez voir les rubriques maladie, nutrition, bien-être, santé, forme, euh, grossesse, bébé euh, et sexualité. Euh, 
malheureusement, il y avait un autre site web euh, avant COVID, c'était Objectif Santé, mais qui malheureusement n'existe plus maintenant. Et vous allez voir la grande photo, ça je vais, euh, je tenais à rajouter justement que les événements, euh, pourquoi les événements? Parce qu'au-delà de la plume, nous voyons que les médias locaux euh, vont plus loin en réunissant les acteurs de la santé avec euh, leurs audiences et lecteurs. Ici, vous allez voir sur l'écran, c'était euh, le salon de la famille et de la santé qui est organisé par Events Plus, qui, est, euh, qui fait partie du groupe euh, du Défi Média Group. Là, c'est vraiment être euh, les médias et vraiment sur tous les fronts, euh, journal, papier, web euh, et maintenant les événements physiques où on peut réunir euh, les gens, euh, nos lecteurs avec les gens, les spécialistes de la, de la santé. Donc là, je vais rentrer un peu dans le vif du sujet qui est euh, l'engagement des médias et journalistes. Euh, justement, quand nous parlons euh, du rôle des médias, nous ne pouvons pas euh, ne pas évoquer l'engagement de ces derniers. Euh, D'abord, il y a l'engagement d'informer, mais aussi euh, celui de sensibiliser. Euh, on, soutient, on soutient notamment des causes euh, à travers des plaidoyers, des associations euh, ou encore des experts de la santé. Euh, par exemple, nous voyons que les médias jouent un rôle, jouent un rôle dans la lutte euh, contre le tabagisme et l'alcoolisme. Il suffit d'ouvrir les journaux pour voir que nous menons vraiment à côté des experts de la santé ce combat. Euh, les médias sont aussi appelés à briser les tabous. Aujourd'hui, euh, avec Merck Foundation, nous parlons d'infertilité, mais cela concerne aussi l'homosexualité, le VIH et la sexualité en général. Euh, pourquoi la sexualité? Pourquoi je le mentionne ici? Parce que le sexe a été toujours tabou. Euh, le sexe, j'englobe aussi la grossesse, euh, l'infertilité, etc. Pourquoi? Parce qu'il euh, y a de moins en moins de rubriques qui sont consacrées à cette cause. On n'en parle pas. Les rubriques, il y a eu pas mal de journaux qui avaient des rubriques sexualité, notamment 5 plus et euh, F2. Mais euh, depuis la COVID, je crois que toutes les rédactions ont été un peu chamboulées, donc on retrouve plus ces, ces rubriques, ce qui est euh, pour le moment malheureux. Donc, euh, pourquoi j'ai ajouté en bas lutter contre la désinformation? C'est l'un des aspects, euh, je pense, le plus important en ce moment, euh, parce que nous voyons avec la COVID-19 à quel point les médias ont un rôle important à jouer en rétablissant les faits. Ensuite, à quel point la désinformation peut mener euh, à des psychoses au sein de la société. Nous le constatons d'ailleurs tous les jours, ces jours-ci. Euh, L'autre diapo, donc justement, euh, en parlant de l'engagement des médias, on ne peut euh, passer sur euh, l'information et la formation. La santé est un domaine en constante évolution. Euh, les recherches, les traitements et même la compréhension de certaines maladies sont constamment en revue. Il est donc extrêmement important pour les journalistes d'être à la page, de savoir ce qui se passe euh, d'abord euh, à Maurice, dans le pays, et ensuite euh, ailleurs dans le monde. Pourquoi je dis que c'est important de, de savoir ce qui se passe autour de nous déjà dans un premier temps? Euh, je pense ici, là, parmi nos, parmi nos participants, combien d'entre vous savent euh, qu'il est actuellement possible à Maurice euh, de congeler ses ovocytes? Euh, ce qui fait qu'une femme euh, de 25 ans actuellement peut congeler ses ovocytes et décider de, euh, de procéder à une fécondation euh, à 40 ans, à 45 ans et d'avoir la même qualité des ovocytes euh, de ses 25 ans. Ça, je pense que c'est une avancée médicale très intéressante et, et c'est là notre rôle de journaliste d'informer, euh, d'aller plus vers le positif journalisme, d'expliquer la situation, de faire comprendre qu'il y a voilà, un problème d'infertilité, mais que de l'autre côté, nous avons aussi des solutions. Donc, comment on oriente euh, le public vers les solutions et là, là, le troisième point, je vais remettre ma casquette de vice-présidente de Mediatrust pour insister sur l'importance de se former continuellement. Là, je parle plus d'un travail personnel, d'un engagement personnel. Et ici, euh, nous avons la chance d'avoir les experts de Merck Foundation aujourd'hui, mais nous comptons aussi beaucoup sur nos collaborateurs habituels. 
nous essayons de toucher une variété de secteurs, dont l'environnement, les finances et la loi, entre autres. Et euh, final, finalement, vous allez voir, bah, euh, je, je parle, euh, je mets pourquoi c'est important de se baser sur les chiffres, les études, les rapports et les faits, euh, parce qu'il y a surtout l'accessibilité des contenus fiables qui, qui devient de plus en plus important. Euh, par exemple, nous savons cette année que le taux de fécondité à Maurice est de 1,4. Comment on le sait? Parce que c'est le dernier rapport de l'UNFPA, c'est les fonds des Nations Unies pour la population sur l'état de la population mondiale 2021. C'est le World Population Dashboard 2021 qui vient d'être publié. Euh, on voit que les chiffres sont des mines d'informations. Je crois que tous les journalistes travaillent dessus. Euh, on attend les, les derniers rapports, les dernières études. Euh, par rapport à la COVID, euh, on voit comment euh, toutes ces informations sont importantes pour l'évolution des, des, des traitements. Mais euh, pourquoi je le précise? Parce que d'autre part, euh, il y a la difficulté d'avoir accès à l'information. Euh, là où la, d'où la raison où je mentionne euh, en bas euh, le Freedom of Information Act, qui est très attendu à Maurice, euh, je pense que ça va venir faciliter un peu les choses ici, euh, d'avoir facilement et rapidement euh, les informations nécessaires pour le, euh, les relayer euh, au public. Euh, juste à titre d'exemple, vous allez voir au niveau de la santé, je suis toujours dans l'ancienne euh, diaporama, juste au niveau de la santé, actuellement, euh, il est impossible de parler à un expert de la santé dans le secteur public sans l'aval du ministère de la Santé. Et cela, euh, ça peut être handicapant pour les journalistes parce qu'on doit justement faire une demande euh, au ministère de l'Éducation, de, euh, de la Santé, qui, ce dernier, à ce moment-là, lui choisit quel médecin, quel expert ils vont nous, nous donner pour une interview ou un reportage. Là, ça complique un peu les choses, ça retarde un peu le processus, le, la chaîne de production des, euh, des médias. Donc, d'où l'importance de mentionner justement le Freedom of Information Act. Donc, euh, pour ce qui est de la contribution de la presse, euh, les choses avancent. Bon, J'étais un peu négatif dans l'ancienne diaporama, mais vous voyez que les choses avancent et les choses avancent dans le bon sens. Le rôle de donneur d'alerte euh, des médias a souvent contribué au durcissement des lois. Je vais venir plus tard sur ces, ces lois qui, ont, qui viennent d'être euh, modifiées. Et euh, pourquoi, comment? Parce que justement, nous avons plusieurs plateformes, euh, nous avons plus d'espace. Euh, et euh, comme je le mentionne, d'un côté, les victimes ont moins peur de parler et de l'autre côté, les médias donnent plus euh, d'espace pour s'exprimer. Donc, euh, je pense que ça, ça devient très important. Prochaine diapo. Donc, justement, dans cette diapo, euh, on voit les changements qui sont en train d'opérer. Euh, à gauche de l'écran, vous allez voir le Children's Bill, euh, où là, il y a eu un grand changement euh, fin de l'année dernière, où l'âge légal du mariage est désormais de 18 ans. Euh, là, on, on voit que les autorités luttent contre le mariage des enfants, des adolescents. Donc, euh, à partir de moins de 18 ans, on ne peut pas se noyer légalement à Maurice. Et à droite de l'écran, vous allez voir, il y a euh, le plan national pour combattre, pour combattre la violence euh, liée au sexe. Euh, C'est un plan national qui a été lancé par le gouvernement, pareil, en fin 2020, 20, euh, l'année dernière. Et ici, pourquoi je le mentionne? Parce que Mediatra s'est aussi impliqué dans ce projet, parce qu'on va venir avec euh, des formations pour les journalistes sur ce sujet. Donc, euh, on voit que les choses avancent. Euh, ici, on voit euh, un extrait des législations euh, qui nous concernent aujourd'hui, donc tout ce qui est rapport aux enfants, à la protection des enfants et aux femmes. Euh, donc, juste pour revenir au thème de, de ma présentation, concernant l'éducation des femmes, euh, on voit, Maurice, il y a une certaine égalité entre les filles et les garçons. Euh, les deux sont scolarisés, d'ailleurs les filles travaillent mieux que les garçons à l'école euh, et ça aussi les statistiques nous le confirment. Donc euh, ça c'est une bonne chose. Par contre, pour ce qui est des mutilations génitales féminines, Maurice n'est pas vraiment concerné par le problème, mais n'empêche euh, qu'il est un sujet extrêmement important à communiquer pour attirer justement l'opinion publique sur ce qui se passe en Afrique et à côté de chez nous. Euh, et au final, je peux dire que le bilan est plus ou moins favorable, mais il y a encore du chemin à faire. Seules les lois ne suffisent pas 
euh, et c'est à nous les médias de continuer à sensibiliser et, et d'inciter à un changement de comportement. Euh, voilà, c'est tout pour moi pour aujourd'hui. Euh, si vous avez des questions, ce sera après les présentations de mes collègues aussi. Merci beaucoup. Merci à Merck Foundation. Merci à Midas Trust euh, de l'opportunité que vous nous donnez aujourd'hui. Thank you very much, Fatima. Um, yes, there are uh, questions. And if you have questions, please ask those questions. Uh, the experts will get onto uh, the platform and answer them. I love uh, Dr. Russia's uh, new T-shirt. <laughs> No to infertility stigma. Uh, yes, I Dr. thought Russia. I will uh, put it on just to yes. um, to show my also uh, support to breaking the stigma of infertility, and uh, I hope this uh, can also be taken forward to uh, all the communities in uh, Mauritius, Madagascar, and Seychelles. I welcome all of them as they are attending today. So uh, I'm very happy that we have media representative from uh, Mauritius, Madagascar, and uh, Seychelles to be with us. And this is not to infertility stigma all across the, uh, uh, the three uh, countries. And uh, of course, uh, all the awards we are going to uh, announce, it is addressed to Mauritius, Madagascar, and Seychelles media representatives, and fashion designers, and filmmakers, and songwriters. So uh, not to infertility stigma altogether, please uh, carry this forward to everywhere, to your families, to your communities. And uh, I'd like to thank very much our previous speaker. It was really amazing. The whole uh, presentation uh, you have done, uh, it, uh, it was really great and showing a very high standard of media coverage, which we are advocates for. Thank you very much, and I will leave you today. Uh, and uh, I, I please uh, uh, enjoy the rest of uh, the training. I, I might join at the end. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Brian. No to Thank you, Dr. Rasha. No to infertility stigma. No to infertility stigma. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, we need to get uh, some of those t shirts here too. Uh, yeah, thank yeah, you so uh, much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, bye bye. Um, bye bye. I want to uh, invite now uh, the chief editor and news presenter at Radio Plus and Tele Plus in Marisha. And it's a Marisha. Hmm? He has yes. more than 20 years of experience in the uh, Mauritian uh, uh, media industry. Uh, he also is the former editor-in-chief yeah, of Radio no, One and served as a correspondent for several regional and international uh, TV channels. He's going to talk about the role of media in reaching out to communities at grassroots levels and raising awareness on health issues. Uh, please welcome with me Jean-Luc Emile. And for the purpose of Jean-Luc Emile's presentation, uh, please note, that uh, during this session, there'll be a poll question uh, that will prompt uh, on your screen in English and in French. You can, of course, uh, uh, participate, we request you to participate and uh, answer uh, that poll question. Thank you very much. John Lo, welcome. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, I'm, I'm very happy because uh, Dr. Rasha wanted this a training program for Mauritius since four years back, and we've been able to, to do it today. Merci encore pour cela. Merci à toute l'équipe uh, qui travaille uh, pour la réalisation uh, de, de ce projet. Alors, uh, justement, donc, uh, je j'ai été partie prenante peut-être de, de la première uh, de ce premier groupe qui voulait uh, faire cette formation pour les journalistes mauriciens, et uh, je réalise que on, y, on est arrivé aujourd'hui. Et merci au Mediatrust de me donner l'opportunité de d'assurer cette partie de la formation euh, aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, nous allons peut-être. Can I have access to the uh, slides, please? Yeah, it's okay. Voilà le, le, le rôle. Nous allons parler justement du rôle euh, de, des médias, de la radio principalement auprès des communautés pour atteindre le petit peuple, mais aussi euh, son pouvoir à disséminer les informations relatives à toutes les questions de, de santé. 
Alors, la, moi, je vais vous parler euh, donc, de la vieille dame hein, qui, qui, qui est la radio, la radio qui est considérée euh, comme euh, la vieille dame. Alors que euh, la technologie continue d'innover, euh, la radio, elle, elle, elle a son rôle, elle continue à, à nous émouvoir, elle continue à nous aider au quotidien, à nous accompagner surtout. Euh, donc, vous, vous voyez, donc, la radio qui, qui émerge, comme une source d'information, on l'a vu, on a vu, vous allez voir aussi dans la présentation par rapport à la COVID-19, tout ce qui s'est passé, donc comment la radio a été quand même dans plusieurs pays une source d'information efficace pour lutter contre la COVID-19. Un outil, allons dire, indispensable de communication, mais aussi pour créer des liens si elle est utilisée de manière judicieuse pour faire passer des informations qui sont parfois précieuses, capitales même, euh, en, en temps de crise. Donc, je vais vous parler de l'expérience mauricienne. Il y, y a beaucoup de journalistes mauriciens qui ont dû suivre pas mal de choses que je vais parler. Je vais aller assez, assez rapidement euh, sur, sur ces points-là. Donc, je n'ai pas euh, vous, vous, vous présenter donc, la, radio, euh, la, la radio à Maurice. Vous savez, nous avons quatre radios privées et pas de télévision privée. Et donc, il y a la station nationale MBC. Euh, donc, la télévision, euh, Cynthia va en parler juste après moi. Mais, mais vous imaginez donc, le poids que représente aujourd'hui la radio privée à Maurice et, et la puissance extraordinaire, euh, justement, euh, de la radio. La radio, comme vous voyez à l'écran, la confiance dans les institutions chute au fil des générations. La génération X, et Y et Z, euh, certains ne font plus confiance euh, aux institutions, mais la radio demeure troisième avec 73,43%. C'était un dernier euh, sondage de Cantor qui vient montrer que la radio demeure quand même un outil. Euh, donc, même les, la jeune génération continue à faire confiance dans cette institution euh, qu'est euh, la radio. Alors, euh, la confiance de la population dans la radio, mais aussi... C'est une confiance renouvelée au quotidien quand on voit le taux d'écoute des radios ici à Maurice, la radio nationale, comme les radios privées. Nous vivons cela en tant que journaliste de radio comme une très grande responsabilité. Cela veut dire que nous devons nous assurer de ce qui est diffusé à la radio, qu'elle soit de qualité, qu'elle soit donc véridique et qu'elle ne soit pas, bien entendu, comme c'est la mode, les fake news. Donc, nous avons vécu l'apparition euh, l'an dernier euh, donc de la COVID-19, la première vague, et comme tous les pays européens et, et, et de l'océan Indien, nous n'étions pas vraiment préparés, nous étions pris de court, même si on savait euh, ce qui se passait ailleurs. Donc, euh, la, la première vague de la COVID-19, malgré toute la profusion de l'information autour de nous, les exemples des pays européens qu'on voyait dans les journaux télévisés, bien évidemment, mais nous avons subi de plein fouet, on peut dire, la crise, avec 10 décès, des contaminations à travers le pays, et les autorités étaient un peu dépassées devant euh, cette situation. Donc, et puis, il y a eu un sondage pendant, pendant, euh, donc pendant la, la pandémie, et juste après, en sortie de pandémie, et quatre mois après donc, la pandémie, 24% des Mauriciens étaient toujours inquiets de, de, de tomber malades. D'ailleurs, leur inquiétude euh, avait sa raison d'être, puisqu'on a vu qu'on est arrivé déjà aujourd'hui dans une deuxième vague qui on est en plein dedans et cela nous touche profondément. Alors, pour nous, au niveau de la radio, je prends l'exemple de la Radio Plus et du Défi Media Group. Il de manière directe, bien entendu, et, mais aussi, de, il était question de communiquer rapidement pour permettre à nos auditeurs de pouvoir justement vivre tout cela. Il fallait agir vite, il fallait agir de manière efficace, directe et communiquer clairement. Donc, à la radio, nous avons bien sûr un rôle à jouer auprès des auditeurs dans la compréhension de la maladie parce que c'était assez nouveau et les gens ne comprenaient pas beaucoup comment on pouvait l'attraper, comment se, se protéger, surtout par rapport à ça, même s'il y avait des campagnes à la télévision. Et il fallait trouver des choses rapidement pour pouvoir permettre aux gens de comprendre comment résister, comment justement lutter contre cette pandémie. Alors, la radio pendant la pandémie, pourquoi la radio La réponse est très, très claire parce que la radio peut atteindre une audience extrêmement importante. À Maurice comme ailleurs sur le continent, la radio peut arriver à atteindre des millions d'informations, des, des séries de, donc de programmes qui ont été designés pour justement 
euh, cette période de la pandémie. Et euh, ce qui a été assez nouvel par rapport à, à, à ce que le Défi Média fait, d'ailleurs l'AMBC le fait aussi, maintenant les autres radios, Radio One, etc., la radiovision, donc la radio, l'émission de la radio est devenue euh, télévision, donc la radiovision, avec le digital, le concours du digital, avec les différentes plateformes, et aussi les émissions donc, interactives pour permettre aux gens de mieux comprendre. Et bien sûr, en ayant euh, sur, sur le plateau euh, des intervenants, euh, pour pouvoir euh, permettre aux gens de vraiment euh, comprendre, mais surtout poser euh, les questions. Alors, je vous disais tout à l'heure euh, que la radio avait euh, une force de frappe. La radio demeure quand même le, le numéro un en termes d'audience euh, à atteindre les gens, même dans les euh, régions les plus éloignées. Et, et ah, c'est le cas d'ailleurs euh, à Maurice, parce que la radio n'a pas besoin euh, donc, euh, de, de data et, et ni euh, des airtime. Donc on peut avec euh, donc, votre pile, votre radio de pile ou alors une prise d'électricité pouvoir euh, justement faire fonctionner votre radio et pouvoir écouter l'information. Donc toute la question démographique, vous voyez donc à l'écran, je ne vais pas euh, revenir dessus, mais euh, ce sont ceux qui font de la radio et ceux qui sont dans, la, dans les médias savent déjà donc la puissance, la force de frappe euh, de la radio. Donc, la radio, aujourd'hui, je vous parlais de la confiance de la radio, l'information euh, euh, à Maurice et ailleurs, l'information diffusée par la radio est, 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 est « trusted ». Donc, on fait confiance euh, souvent le plus à, à la radio parce qu'on entend les gens, on entend les personnes intervenir live et il n'y a pas de grand risque de manipulation euh, de l'information à l'on dire. Alors, la radio va où la technologie parfois n'y arrive pas. Donc, c'est pourquoi la radio est un outil important dans la dissémination de l'information, la dissémination de l'information, surtout par rapport au petit peuple, par rapport à ceux qui n'ont pas vraiment accès à l'Internet. Et souvent, quand on parle à ceux qui vivent en Afrique, souvent dans les régions, il n'y a pas suffisamment de connectivité et les gens n'ont pas accès à, à, à l'outil informatique. Et justement, c'est la radio qui joue ce rôle qui emmène l'information, qui délivre cette information vers ceux euh, qui n'ont pas les moyens euh, aujourd'hui de se connecter. Oui, parce qu'il y en a même en, en 2021, alors que nous, nous sommes dans un monde de technologie digitale, il y a ceux euh, qui sont toujours euh, coincés donc, par rapport à la question euh, de la technologie euh, informatique dans ces pays euh, où il y a rien la guerre, où il y a quand même euh, des situations extrêmement, extrêmement euh, difficiles où la radio uniquement arrive à faire passer euh, ces informations. Je vais revenir sur euh, donc, les journalistes mauriciens qui nous suivent là, ils connaissent le cœur sur les années, bien entendu, et qui a été pour moi, pour, pour beaucoup, dans la campagne de sensibilisation pendant la COVID-19. Euh, nous avons fait une, une vidéo euh, au défi Media Group euh, avec un langage très simple où il a pu expliquer. Euh, beaucoup de personnes ne savaient pas comment il fallait se laver les mains pendant la COVID-19, comment euh, bien se laver les mains. On pouvait savoir, bien sûr, devant le robinet, se rincer les mains, mais on ne savait pas se laver euh, réellement euh, bien les mains. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il fallait faire Une vidéo euh, que nous avions réalisée de lui, l'interview. Euh, Peut-être si j'arrive à faire jouer cette vidéo euh, entre temps. Nous, nous prenons un peu l'alcool, nous passons là, nous prenons un petit coton. Le portable est facile, nous passons bien méticuleusement. Dans tout ce coin, partout, parce que vous savez, vous prenez une graine de sable, une graine de sable, qui est 10 000 fois, pour gagner un virus. Alors, vous imaginez, les cas rentrent vraiment partout, les cas c'est là, et la moindre occasion, ils gagnent ça. Mais vous prenez l'alcool là, ou avec un coton, ou une Alors, le, le docteur Ganesh avait, avait une, une image, euh, donc euh, un propos imagé, allons dire, euh, un geste qu'on fait au quotidien, on, on prend son téléphone de sa poche, on pose sur une table. Euh, on, on le récupère 500 fois par jour et il avait expliqué que le téléphone portable pouvait être justement euh, donc une courroie de transmission de la COVID-19 et comment il fallait nettoyer euh, tous les soirs son téléphone portable, quel geste faire. Regardez euh, donc à l'écran cette image, plus de 116 000 vues pour cette vidéo. En temps normal, vous m'auriez dit ça, je vous aurais dit, euh, pff, donc il, il fallait chercher encore pour avoir 116 000. 116 000 vues sur YouTube pour une vidéo montrant comment on se lave les mains et comment on nettoie son téléphone. C'est dire à quel point ces gestes pratiques 
ont été essentielles dans la compréhension de, de la maladie, mais aussi comment euh, assurer la prévention de la maladie euh, à travers donc, euh, ces petits gestes. Je pense que euh, le, le Canèche a eu un langage franc, euh, il a été très clair et il a su communiquer, il a su parler. Et euh, ce message a été diffusé plusieurs fois à la radio et euh, également sur notre site web euh, du défimedia.info et euh, d'où justement la résonance euh, de euh, ces propos. Et je pense qu'avec euh, la deuxième vague, les gens connaissent un peu mieux comment euh, laver euh, donc, euh, ses mains, comment il faut faire justement, quels sont les gestes à faire et comment nettoyer euh, son euh, téléphone portable pour s'assurer de ne pas se transmettre euh, le virus. Il y a eu aussi, euh, comme je vous dis, la, la radiovision, donc pour Télé Plus, l'émission de la santé. Euh, au moment où la question de la vaccination se posait, il y a toute une campagne sur la vaccination, quel vaccin faire, est-ce que c'est sensible, est-ce que c'est pas bien, est-ce qu'il faut le faire. Euh, il y a eu une série d'émissions, donc radiovision à la fois euh, sur la radio et euh, sur le web. Il y a eu aussi euh, toute la bonjour. campagne euh, bonjour, autour, bonjour à tous. Euh, de, de l'AstraZeneca. Bonjour et bienvenue que, dans votre émission. Euh, Allô, docteur, bien spécial, vous l'avez compris, parce que nous vous causez permettait aux gens euh, de se protéger réellement. Donc, il y a eu euh, toutes sortes de polémiques autour du vaccin. Et euh, grâce à ces émissions radio, nous avons pu peut-être démystifier toute la question euh, de la vaccination à Maurice et permettre aux gens vraiment de bien comprendre. Ce nous aime le bande, donc en mars dernier, la dissémination de, de l'information, nous avons tenté, euh, nous, euh, donc, de proposer euh, encore une fois des choses aux, aux Mauriciens pour pouvoir assurer que la radio, par exemple, qui diffusait le National Communication Committee de Press Briefing en live, qui d'ailleurs continue à le faire. Euh, L'annonce de la zone rouge, par exemple, un grand moment où les, les gens veulent savoir si ma région est en zone rouge, les, 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 les nouveaux cas qui sont annoncés euh, en temps réel et également les informations euh, et les précautions à prendre suivant euh, ce que les autorités donnent ou alors les professionnels euh, de santé. Je pense que pour ce deuxième lockdown également, l'outil, euh, la radio a été d'une grande aide. Moi, je voudrais revenir aussi sur euh, cette, cette fille que vous voyez, que, que les journalistes qui nous suivent euh, connaissent bien maintenant, Nojahan Ganga, euh, qui avait participé à la session de prière avec 250 personnes. C'était la première à briser le tabou. Dans son travail, elle travaille dans une compagnie de sécurité. Elle est universitaire, elle a pu amener aussi des étudiants euh, de l'université euh, qu'elle fréquentait. Donc, euh, du coup, euh, nous, on s'est dit qu'il fallait la voir et elle était disposée à parler, à raconter un peu ce qui s'est passé, à raconter justement cette session de prière. Et ce même soir, elle est en live sur la radio. Elle est en live sur la radio. 49 000 vues euh, à un moment donné et le pic à 51 000 vues euh, instantanées du jamais réalisé dans le paysage audiovisuel avec ce nombre de vues. Euh, J'étais sur le plateau avec Nawaz Nobuk ce soir-là. Et euh, donc, euh, on, a, on a fait ce record dans le paysage audiovisuel. Pour vous dire qu'il était presque 22 heures, aujourd'hui, la radio nous permet d'avoir une audience euh, que la presse écrite, malheureusement, n'arrive pas à nous faire avoir. Grâce à la force de la radio, on arrive justement à, à donner cette information. Et elle, elle a été pour beaucoup dans, euh, pour le contact tracing pour permettre aux gens euh, de se faire connaître auprès du ministère de la Santé et aller se faire dépister si vous étiez justement dans cette cérémonie et donc euh, de prier chez elle. Donc voilà à quel point la radio, euh, l'outil euh, radio et euh, la force de, cette, de la radio pour pouvoir nous permettre à communiquer donc, de manière rapide auprès des gens et permettre aux gens euh, d'agir efficacement et rapidement. Donc, la communication de la radio en temps de crise, malheureusement, parfois, les autorités ne communiquent pas. En ce moment, il y a toute la question des écoles. Les parents veulent savoir quelles sont les écoles qui sont fermées. Les informations arrivent euh, au compte goutte Mais euh, donc, l'outil informatique, euh, donc, euh, les médias en ligne, la radio, peuvent aider justement dans la communication de crise et permettre à établir une communication entre la communauté et bien sûr les autorités. C'est un peu le rôle euh, donc, que nous avons, nous informer, éduquer, bien sûr, et également divertir. Donc, la radio a toujours été justement ce véhicule euh, de, de communication euh, dans, en temps de crise. Nous avons comme des cyclones à Maurice. Donc, euh, la radio a, nous a toujours accompagnés dans ce moment difficile et encore plus aujourd'hui avec la COVID-19 euh, que nous voyons. Donc, euh, aujourd'hui, il s'agit d'être responsive, réactif, d'être euh, vraiment 
euh, fiable, hein, donc, euh, sur, sur qui on peut compter, et aussi pour les journalistes et les animateurs d'être motivés et être de l'action, être sur le terrain au plus près, même euh, donc, euh, en cas de Covid, de prendre les précautions, bien, bien entendu, les précautions euh, nécessaires. La radio nous permet de nous connecter avec les gens, la radio nous permet euh, de rendre efficace des campagnes de sensibilisation et de prévention surtout, et euh, de, de pouvoir faire de l'awareness, euh, surtout principalement, ce dont on parle aujourd'hui sur la question là, je parle du Covid, mais sur la question de l'infertilité, c'est vrai qu'à Maurice, on n'en parle pas beaucoup, tout à l'heure, le docteur Trichard disait le rôle euh, des médias, mais il est important aussi euh, donc pour nous d'aider à briser ce tabou parce que l'infertilité demeure un sujet extrêmement tabou, euh, allons dire, mais euh, au même titre que le HIV, etc. Donc aujourd'hui, peut-être que la radio, euh, avec plus d'émissions, plus de programmes de focus, a, a créé l'AONS qu'on pourra euh, certainement y, y arriver. Donc, euh, je, je souhaiterais peut-être plus répondre aux questions. Voilà, voilà euh, en clair, moi, ce que j'avais à vous dire sur euh, toute la question des de, de bénéfices de la radio, le rôle de la radio, euh, ce, ce médium ultra puissant, qui, qui peut nous permettre justement de connecter les gens et permettre aux gens vraiment, vraiment d'avoir les informations et surtout ceux qui n'ont pas accès à l'outil informatique et surtout la radio là en ce moment euh, donc aurait pu être l'outil qu'on utilise pour faire l'éducation euh, pour ceux qui ne peuvent pas partir à l'école, ceux qui sont en zone rouge, sont à la maison, la télévision euh, aide, le, le, le online teaching aide, mais également la radio aurait pu être euh, euh, le courroie de transmission euh, de ces programmes éducatifs. Voilà, pour vous remercier de votre attention. Thank voilà. you very much, uh, so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, there are uh, already um, um, uh, some, you know, comments. I guess you can get there and answer some of those questions. I see. The different specialists have, have also gone onto the platform and answered those questions. Please continue uh, bringing them and also share your experience in case uh, uh, there's something that uh, you know you'd like comment. Would definitely love uh, those um, uh, comments uh, from you. Uh, that was Jean Luc Emil. I can't wait to see you also again when. Uh, Corona is yeah, done. sure. Uh, in Mauritius, sure, sure. I still no, remember you. It's some years well, now, right? <laughs> yes, it's some um, years. <laughs> we have not seen each other for two years, I'm, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Let me now welcome the senior news editor at the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, she uh, is a news reporter, is a TV anchor since 2001. She has a weekly program on health for television in Creole since uh, 2012. She'll be speaking on the role of television reaching out to communities and raising awareness, especially during the pandemic. Cynthia Moto, welcome. Thank you, Brian uh, Mug uh, Foundation, uh, membre de, du Media Trust de Maurice, mes confrères et consoeurs, tous les participants de Maurice, de Madagascar et des Seychelles, bon après-midi à tous. Je suis donc très heureuse d'être avec vous pour cette formation pour uh, les médias sur la santé. Pour ma part, je vais m'apesantir sur le rôle de la télévision comme outil de communication et de sensibilisation, en particulier dans ce contexte de pandémie. La télévision s'est donc euh, affirmée encore une fois euh, comme service essentiel pendant cette crise sanitaire. Comme euh, les autres médias d'ailleurs, elle a comme rôle principal d'informer, d'éduquer et de distraire. Donc euh, même pendant cette pandémie, la télévision n'a pas arrêté de jouer euh, ses rôles, bien au contraire. Elle a dû s'adapter pour répondre euh, aux nouveaux besoins de son public en termes de liens sociaux, d'information et de distraire. Divertissement. Cet outil de communication a prouvé qu'il a un impact important sur son public et qu'il a le pouvoir d'influencer les valeurs, les attitudes et les perceptions de manière positive et même négative. C'est un outil très puissant pour aider à sensibiliser et à éduquer le public et accroître aussi les connaissances. 
la télévision peut aussi être utile pour attirer l'attention des autorités sur les problématiques qui touchent de plus près les populations afin de dégager des stratégies appropriées pour le développement et le mieux-être de ces populations ou communautés particulières. D'après une étude dans le monde en 2020, 1,7 milliard de foyers possédaient un téléviseur. La télévision est donc plus qu'une lucarne sur le monde. Grâce à elle, nous sommes au courant de presque tout ce qui se passe sur notre terre et pendant des années, voire des décennies, la télévision était le loisir principal autour de laquelle les familles se réunissaient. Avec l'apport des nouvelles technologies, elle a eu la concurrence, tablettes, ordinateurs, téléphones connectés, ce qui a poussé le petit écran à évoluer aussi pour garder cette proximité avec son public. Donc, quel a été le rôle particulier de la télévision en cette période de pandémie Cette pandémie nous a quelque peu forcé à nous séparer. L'être humain est un animal social. Il a besoin de côtoyer les autres, d'échanger avec les autres, de se toucher. Mais cette pandémie nous a obligés à garder nos distances des autres, à nous confiner. Mais comment rester loin des autres pour se protéger de ce virus tout en restant connecté C'est là que les médias en général ont joué et continuent de jouer un rôle important. On peut dire que cette pandémie est venue donner une plus-value aux médias. Et parmi ces médias, la télévision est devenue un partenaire indispensable, surtout lors des différents confinements. Confiné, cloîtré chez soi, il fallait gérer ce temps passé chez soi pendant des jours, voire des semaines ou même des mois. Le temps passé devant son écran de télévision a considérablement augmenté pendant les confinements. Certains parlent même de surconsommation des écrans, ce qui n'est pas faux d'ailleurs. Mais revenons aux différents rôles de la télévision pendant cette période de crise sanitaire. Donc, en tout premier lieu, le poste de télévision reste le vecteur des informations, des informations en général, mais aussi de l'évolution de cette pandémie dans le monde et dans nos pays respectifs. Le nombre de chaînes d'information qui faisaient et font leur une avec la COVID-19, donc le nombre de personnes qui regardent les chaînes d'information et les bulletins d'information a considérablement augmenté. Si l'offre pour les informations était grande, la demande venant aussi du public pour ces informations étaient croissantes. Et donc, quelle a été la réponse des diffuseurs face à cette situation inédite Il y a eu des mises à jour au quotidien sur l'évolution de la situation, des reportages ciblés, des émissions en direct, des talk shows, des interviews, des breaking news. Pour les autorités, la télévision est devenue ou redevenue un moyen de transmettre les dernières informations et aussi les décisions gouvernementales concernant cette crise sanitaire comme les confinements, les couvre-feux, entre autres, car c'est un outil de communication de masse. Le nombre et la fréquence des interventions des autorités ou des spécialistes de la santé ont grimpé sur le petit écran. C'est d'ailleurs une tendance mondiale où les gouvernants, autorités ont utilisé la télévision comme plateforme de communication pour leur population. À titre d'exemple, des points de presse quotidiens, ou hebdomadaires ou selon l'évolution de la situation, des annonces sur les confinements ou l'allègement des mesures ou des plans de lutte contre le virus, les dispositions pratiques à prendre pour aller travailler ou faire ses courses, les autorisations de sortie, pour ne citer que. À Maurice, par exemple, comme partout ailleurs, depuis le début de la pandémie en 2020 et pendant les différents confinements, les interventions du ministère de la Santé étaient sur une base quotidienne pendant plusieurs mois pour donner les dernières informations sur l'évolution de la situation dans le pays. La télévision est aussi un médium idéal pour les messages à véhiculer, par exemple sur les gestes barrières. Les gestes barrières donc, euh, avec la vaccination sont actuellement, selon des spécialistes, les meilleures armes pour combattre et diminuer la propagation du virus. Next slide, please. Thank you. Donc, port du masque, gel hydroalcoolique, distanciation physique, c'est le refrain que nous entendons depuis 2020 et avec des messages qui passent en boucle lors des pauses publicitaires, cela finit par devenir des automatismes pour ceux qui les regardent. Le, visu le visuel est donc important, comme l'a dit Jean-Luc un peu plus tôt, tout comme le sonore, mais certains messages passent plus facilement quand on les voit, comme par exemple pour les gestes barrières, surtout pour atteindre les populations isolées et donc un public très large. 
pour euh, donc, les diffuseurs, il a fallu également euh, s'adapter par rapport euh, aux émissions produites. Les émissions enregistrées sans interaction du public, garder la distanciation physique lors des diffusions d'informations, entre autres. C'est aussi une façon de donner l'exemple en matière de gestes barrières. Et donc, avec la profusion d'informations de toutes parts de différents médias, il faut aussi pouvoir identifier le vrai du faux, le choix des informations à transmettre et que l'on reçoit est donc primordial, un choix dicté par la pertinence de ces infos et surtout la crédibilité de ceux qui, la diffusent, qui les diffusent plutôt. Donc, quelles sont les questions à se poser Est-ce que donc, ces informations seront utiles au public Ces informations serviront-elles à prévenir, à les aider, à faire un choix, à les guider Est-ce qu'elles sont vérifiables et vérifiées Là, c'est l'origine de la source qui est importante. Est-ce que ces informations sont précises, justes et équilibrées Depuis l'avènement de cette crise sanitaire, on entend beaucoup de contradictions concernant la COVID-19. Cela a commencé d'ailleurs avec l'origine du virus, puis avec la vaccination ou les effets secondaires. Des informations qui peuvent donc apporter le doute dans la tête du public, d'où le rôle donc important de celui qui diffuse les informations, comme le journaliste, de communiquer des informations qui sont précises, vérifiées, directes et sans ambiguïté, sans sensationnalisme pour ne créer aucune confusion. Donc, quelles images choisir Le bon choix des images est essentiel. Cela aura certainement un impact sur la compréhension et l'assimilation du message que l'on veut véhiculer. Des images qui vont certainement susciter une réaction chez le téléspectateur. Depuis le début de la pandémie, nous avons en tête beaucoup d'images fortes, celles de la ville de Wuhan, confinée en Chine, foyer de la pandémie, ou des patients en réanimation dans plusieurs pays, ou des villes iconiques qui sont désertes ou désertées en raison des confinements, le désespoir vécu récemment en Inde avec le variant Delta. On dit donc que les images parle mieux que le texte lui-même. Ces images diffusées à la télévision resteront donc gravées dans notre mémoire. Et on peut se poser la question aussi, quelle langue la plus appropriée pour toucher le maximum de personnes Tout dépendra du public visé. Pour atteindre l'objectif fixé, il nous faut choisir la langue qui s'y est le mieux. En général, c'est la langue maternelle du pays ou la langue officielle, si elle est comprise par une très grande majorité. Il faut que ce soit un langage simple et accessible à tous pour une meilleure compréhension du message véhiculé. Et pour la télévision, c'est un texte simple et concis, comme pour la radio d'ailleurs. Donc, nous parlons beaucoup de la COVID, mais aussi, nous ne devons pas oublier qu'à part la COVID-19, il y a d'autres problèmes de santé, d'autres soucis. Donc, c'est vrai que la COVID-19 est venue chambouler notre quotidien, voire même envahir notre espace info. Mais d'autres problèmes qui existaient déjà avant sont toujours là et perdurent, même s'ils ont été occultés. Et c'est vrai aussi de dire que la COVID-19 a engendré de nouveaux problèmes, perte d'emploi, perte de proches, de plus d'angoisse et de stress, problèmes psychologiques pour ne citer que. Pour ces difficultés outre la COVID, il est donc important de continuer d'en parler pour que ceux qui en sont affectés ne se sentent pas exclus. Et comment le faire Encore une fois, c'est à travers les informations, les émissions, des débats avec des professionnels du milieu comme intervenants et aussi et surtout ceux qui sont au cœur même de la situation difficile. Par exemple, c'est important de rappeler que les patients diabétiques, cancéreux, ou qui souffrent d'autres pathologies euh, n'ont pas disparu avec la COVID. Ils sont toujours là. Et il y a la continuité des soins dans les centres de santé. C'est important aussi de montrer à la télévision, euh, et cela n'a pas été occulté, même si euh, on s'est beaucoup apesanti sur les systèmes de santé surchargés à cause de la situation sanitaire. Et je reviens donc sur le visuel qui est très important, voir à la télé que l'on parle des autres problématiques autres que la COVID. Ça aide déjà la personne concernée à ne plus se sentir seule ou oubliée, comme la stigmatisation de l'infertilité, par exemple. Et la personne peut également être rassurée que le soutien existe, qu'il provienne des autorités ou des ONG et aussi où aller pour obtenir ce soutien. 
Donc, à côté de son rôle d'informer, la télévision a été très utile aussi pour assurer la continuité pédagogique et l'apprentissage à distance. Avec la pandémie, le secteur éducatif a été perturbé, des écoles sont restées fermées, les déplacements étaient interdits ou même limités. Selon l'UNESCO, plus de 820 millions d'élèves dans le monde n'ont pas accès à un outil informatique chez eux. Plus de 700 millions n'ont pas d'Internet et plus de 56 millions vivent dans des zones non couvertes par les réseaux de téléphonie mobile. Donc, avec la fracture numérique, l'accès aux technologies pour l'enseignement à distance n'est pas égal pour tous. Et comme il a fallu donc trouver des solutions rapides et efficaces, la télévision et la radio aussi étaient les alternatives pour l'enseignement à distance. Toujours selon l'UNESCO, le continent africain a été la région la plus active à utiliser la télévision ou la radio pour les émissions éducatives, soit 70% des pays, donc la télévision a eu un rôle très important à jouer. Exemple à Maurice, donc, euh, pendant les deux semaines qui ont précédé la rentrée en présentiel pour cette euh, présente année scolaire, les cours euh, ont été dispensés en ligne et aussi à la télévision pour la continuité pédagogique. Certes, il y a des améliorations à apporter, mais dans une situation d'urgence, ce travail a pu être accompli grâce à la collaboration des diffuseurs, des autorités éducatives et aussi des éducateurs. La télévision donc, euh, peut aussi avoir un rôle refuge. Je m'explique. Cette pandémie nous a démontré que rien n'est acquis. Un tout petit rien peut tout chambouler. Cette crise sanitaire a eu un effet déstabilisateur, certes sur le plan mondial, collectif, mais aussi personnel. Beaucoup se sont sentis perdus. La télévision a donc servi de réconfort pour ces gens. Un lien entre l'être seul chez lui et le monde D'où l'importance pour la télévision de consolider ce lien avec des émissions, des programmes adaptés et bien conçus pour un public varié. Et j'en viens au rôle de divertissement de la télévision avec des programmes faciles à regarder pour un public large. La télévision, un moyen classique de se distraire. Les chaînes de télévision ont dû s'adapter, ont dû créer des concepts pour un public en quête d'évasion. Ce public qui n'avait d'autre choix que de rester cloîtré chez lui. En général, la télévision s'est adaptée au confinement en proposant une grande variété de programmes culturels et artistiques. Et autre fonction de la télévision pendant cette crise sanitaire, elle a été vue comme une passerelle entre les lieux de culte et les fidèles, comme pour la diffusion des cérémonies religieuses. Des images fortes qui ont beaucoup marqué le pèlerinage de la Mecque sans la foule habituelle, la place Saint-Pierre à Rome vide, pour la fête de Pâques, et grâce au petit écran, ce lien a pu être maintenu. Jean, je prends en exemple l'île Maurice, donc un pays multi-ethnique, multiculturel, multi-religieux, avec de nombreuses fêtes et rassemblements religieux tout au long de l'année qui sont suivis et célébrés au niveau national. Cette pandémie a tout chamboulé, point de rassemblement dans les lieux de culte, point de rassemblement pour les fêtes. Donc la télévision qui est une télévision publique à Maurice s'est faite le pont entre les fidèles et leurs religions respectives. Donc il y a eu des heures de retransmission en direct pour chacune des communautés concernées lors des fêtes. Et finalement, on peut se demander si la télévision a pu mener a bien ces différentes fonctions malgré le contexte particulier de la pandémie La réponse est oui. Certes, elle doit continuer d'évoluer, de se réinventer et d'améliorer son accessibilité pour garder la proximité et l'intérêt de son public. Mais déjà, avec une meilleure connectivité, la télévision se fait mobile avec la possibilité de visionner les différentes chaînes sur son téléphone portable, peu importe où on est, et bien sûr, s'il n'y a pas de souci de connectivité. Et voilà, je vous remercie de votre attention. Thank you very much. Merci. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I see already a question in French. Uh, I, you know, I request you to get on to there and, and uh, answer. To all of you who have participated also in the poll, uh, thank you so much for getting on. 
And if you haven't, please take a minute and uh, respond to that. Um, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Ashok Bihari, the Secretary of the Media Trust Board, so also the coordinator and the journalist at the Mauritius Broadcasting Corporation, uh, to give a vote of thanks. Oui, merci beaucoup. Donc, je suis heureux au nom du Conseil d'administration du Media Trust. Je présente les excuses du président qui ne peut pas être présent aujourd'hui. Moi, je suis le secrétaire général. Donc, au nom euh, des membres du Media Trust, je tiens à adresser nos remerciements. D'abord, à la Merck Foundation, à son sa CEO, la sénatrice Dr. Racha Kelech, à toute l'équipe organisatrice au niveau de la Merck Foundation, mais aussi, merci aussi à toutes les personnes ressources, les panélistes qui sont intervenus aujourd'hui, et merci à tous les journalistes qui ont participé à cette session de la République de Maurice, y compris de Roderick, Madagascar et Seychelles. Voici donc un partenariat dont nous sommes très fiers. Nous sommes heureux de voir aboutir à cette initiative de formation sur des thèmes très pertinents allant de l'infertilité dans tous ses aspects, dont la stigmatisation, l'autonomisation et la sensibilisation des femmes, le rôle des médias, mais aussi toute la couverture et le traitement de la COVID-19. Les présentations, vous en conviendrez, ont été très informatives, intéressantes, percutantes et bien ficelées et je suis sûr seront utiles à tous les participants dans l'exercice de leur métier. Je suis sûr donc que ces présentations, cette session, cette formation a aiguisé votre appétit. Donc nous souhaitons pouvoir accueillir d'autres formations de ce genre, possiblement dans un proche avenir et si possible en présentiel, c'est-à-dire physiquement, avec des participants, avec la Merck Foundation et nos partenaires. Donc, nous sommes heureux d'avoir contribué à cette initiative. Et je dis encore une fois, merci à tout le monde. Thank you, thank you. Merci. And of course, Media Trust uh, for, for uh, being a partner for this particular training. Um, once again, thank you so much for uh, being a part. Oh, there's a question here. Uh, to what extent can competition influence the quality and reliability of information affecting an area as sensitive as public health? I think uh, uh, this question uh, is, uh, is uh, for you, uh, Jean-Luc, and uh, also Cynthia, I think if you can answer that, uh, you can also uh, add your voice to that. Uh, Fatima, are you able to answer that? To what extent um, can competition influence the quality and reliability of information affecting an area sensitive as public health? Yes, thank you. Um, I will reply in, in French. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. Yes. Um, donc, uh, dans ma présentation, vous avez vu déjà, on a une panoplie de journaux, de médias différents uh, en Maurice. Donc, je pense que cela contribue quelque part à avoir une compétition uh, saine. Uh, chacun porte, je pense, sa pierre à l'édifice. Uh, quand, quand on parle d'infertilité, uh, nous avons eu uh, aujourd'hui uh, dans cette formation uh, tellement de ressources, probablement que... Uh, tu ne peux pas euh, faire partie d'un article de presse. Donc euh, là, je pense que vraiment, on a la possibilité euh, d'avoir différents médias qui parlent de différents aspects. Euh, C'est pour... Moi, je pense que le lecteur, le public a tout à gagner avec euh, cette compétition qui est, qui est pour moi plus ou moins saine. Mais quand même... Euh, L'autre point que j'ai abordé, c'est l'accès euh, à l'information. Euh, là aussi, je pense euh, qu'on a du chemin à faire pour que tous les médias, Maurice, sont représentés 
et sont, euh, sont un peu le même niveau. Voilà. Peut-être Jean-Luc ou Cynthia peut rajouter dessus. Uh, maybe Brian, I, I can I, I can answer to I can answer to uh, one question. I think Fatima uh, started replying about the uh, to what extent the competition influences the quality and reliability of information. Can you hear me, Fatima? It's okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Je, je voudrais juste ajouter par rapport à cela que justement cette, ce, ce, allons dire cet environnement de compétition aujourd'hui euh, nous, nous pousse vraiment à être efficace et à être surtout, euh, moi je dirais, euh, plus dynamique, dans, dans, et, mais, mais, mais surtout faire beaucoup faire, faire très attention par rapport, nous opérons aujourd'hui sur la plateforme digitale et une information est vite partagée par des centaines, des milliers de personnes et il est important aujourd'hui de revoir le standard de qualité de l'information euh, qui est diffusée et ça nous force vraiment à, 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 à reprendre les bases de notre profession, la vérification de l'information, la base même, l'essence même de notre métier, vérifier, contre-vérifier pour ne pas euh, donner des informations qui sont approximatives. Mais en même temps, disant cela, nous avons aussi la concurrence, euh, donc entre guillemets, déloyale des, des, euh, des blogs et en même temps des journalistes citoyens qui, qui cause un tort immense à la profession parfois parce que les gens commencent à, à voir parfois que ce que le journal citoyen publie est devenu la règle. Quand le, le journal ou le média mainstream ne va pas dans le même sens, ne publie pas cette information-là parce que nous avons le devoir de vérifier contre vérifier, et eux non. Et quand on ne dit pas ça, on, 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 on a tendance à être taxé de, on est en train de couvrir le gouvernement, on est en train de cacher de l'information. Or, nous n'avons pas les mêmes critères pour publier une information qu'un qu un média, euh, donc sur le net qui fait du buzz ou alors euh, un journaliste citoyen. Nous avons, euh, nous sommes des médias responsables, nous avons, euh, nous sommes obligés de respecter la déontologie journalistique et qui, malheureusement, euh, prend beaucoup, un peu plus de temps pour vérifier la, la, la contre-vérification de l'information. Alors que le journaliste citoyen, lui, il voit quelque chose se passe comme il y a eu euh, pendant, pendant Wakashio. Euh, on a vu des, 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 on avait vu des, des baleines. Et il y a des médias mainstream qui ont malheureusement publié cela. Et, et, et ce n'est pas de l'information. Donc, il faut faire très attention aujourd'hui. Et nous avons un rôle, peut-être que euh, nous, journalistes, nous devons aussi dire autour de nous attention, il y a certainement des blogs, il y a certainement des, des journalistes citoyens, mais nous sommes obligés aujourd'hui, nous, de dire que notre métier, c'est de faire de la vraie information et d'assurer que le contenu que nous donnons aux gens, qu'elle soit euh, gratuite ou alors que vous payez pour cela, elle soit de qualité. OK. Let me ask uh, Philippe et Marie, are you there? Philippe, Marie? Oui, on entend, je pense. Hein? On entend. Ouais, vous pouvez continuer. OK, d'accord. OK, OK. Bonjour tout le monde. Alors, je suis très contente euh, de participer euh, aujourd'hui. Je suis euh, la coordinatrice de la MBC Rodrigue FM. Et très contente parce que nous sommes très proches de, de nos auditeurs à Rodrigue. C'est une radio de proximité. Et euh, j'ai fait un peu de télévision aussi auparavant. Et j'aimerais savoir parce que euh, à la télé, c'est plus facile de, de disons, d'attirer euh, l'attention des, des spectateurs. Mais comment est-ce que nous, à la radio, nous pouvons être encore plus proches de la population euh, en abordant un sujet euh, aussi délicat que euh, l'infertilité hein? euh, Comment est-ce que, quels sont les outils que nous pouvons utiliser pour euh, attirer l'attention de nos auditeurs. Merci. OK. Um, let me uh, invite uh, Jean-Luc. Uh, what are the tools to use to, to invite listeners? Uh, yes, thank you, Brian. Uh, uh, je voudrais juste peut-être... Uh, J'ai vu une question de Martin Lutchman 
euh, que nous n'arrivons pas à voir, euh, donc euh, à poser la question directe. Martin euh, demandait justement est-ce qu'un citoyen pouvait s'improviser journaliste. Ça répond un peu à ce que je disais juste avant. Donc, alors que le citoyen n'a pas les règles, n'a pas le, res, le respect de la déontologie, alors que nous, nous avons le respect de, de, la, de la déontologie. Pour revenir à, à, à la question de, de Brian par rapport à, à l'outil qu'on peut utiliser, et bien entendu, je pense qu'aujourd'hui, les réseaux sociaux euh, sont devenus, euh, allons dire, Facebook, une caisse de résonance pour tout ce qu'on fait au niveau de la radio. C'est là qu'on va avoir les 16-24 ans, c'est là que la grande masse, l'audience se trouve sur les réseaux et euh, les réseaux pour les atteindre euh, d'une part, mais aussi utiliser les réseaux pour les ramener vers la radio. Parce qu'il y, y a des choses peut-être euh, qu'on arrive à faire passer sur les réseaux sociaux, les photos, les vidéos, mais euh, l'outil demeure quand même, comme je le disais dans la présentation, euh, un véhicule puissant de l'information. Et parce que la radio, on peut faire 10 000 choses à la fois, on écoute la radio, on est sa voiture, on conduit, on écoute. Donc, on peut drive, comme on dit, euh, des personnes à partir de, donc, des réseaux sociaux et emmener vers la radio. C'est un peu ce qu'on fait, nous, et, et vice versa, de la radio vers les réseaux sociaux. Et, et aujourd'hui, ce qu'il y avait dans le temps, même pour la presse écrite, par exemple, euh, dans le temps, il y avait les crieurs de, de coin de rue qui vendaient les articles des journaux, qui criaient ce qu'il y avait en une des journaux. Aujourd'hui, les réseaux sociaux ont remplacé ces crieurs et qui euh, donc sont devenus un peu là comme euh, ceux qui annoncent ce que vous allez voir dans le journal du lendemain, ce que vous allez euh, entendre à la radio de l'émission qui, qui va suivre. Donc, je pense que l'outil serait utilisé judicieusement aujourd'hui, les réseaux sociaux, pour amener euh, les gens vers une information beaucoup plus étendue, beaucoup plus vérifiée, etc. Et souvent, les réseaux, c'est rapide, deux lignes, on donne l'information, mais la radio, on peut aller plus longuement, c'est aller plus longuement, avoir des débats, des discussions autour euh, d'un sujet. Ah, uh, thank you so much, John Locke. I, I, I think, uh, even me at this point, I think I, I can say something since I, I, I host a radio show in the morning and I don't know what the experience is like in Mauritius, but, you know, people like things, people like to talk about things like relationships and sex and marriage. And those are easy things to to bring to your audience. Um, I, I work at a, a radio station that is primarily, you know, politics and it's it's the biggest station in, in you know, the East African region is one of the biggest. But every time we talk about something concerning relationships or sex or marriage, you know, people are interested. Ladies are interested. So if you, if you bring these conversations, to your audiences. I think they will receive them uh, very, very well. Uh, Facebook is a good platform to utilize um, and, and have those conversations going. You can also uh, bring them in, 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 in as stories or as problems yeah. that people are having in their relationships. So for us, that's how we are able to change the angle. You don't have to bring you know, Dr. Lugano to explain the, you know, the very hard concepts, uh, that might scare some people. Some people don't consume, you know, difficult concepts easily. But you can say, someone has written to our show and they are saying, hi, my name is uh, Jean-Luc. I, I, I have a, a complaint or I have an issue with my partner. We have been trying to have children for, you know, 12 years. What can I do? And your knowledge as a journalist, a health journalist, you are able to feed them, to give them this information uh, because of the training, you know, like uh, for, from a training like this. So that's how we are able to break down very difficult concepts to the audiences. And maybe promise them that on the next show, I will bring, you know, Dr. Lugano to explain and, and let's talk about this, you know, send your questions and audiences will be able to, to, to take that information. The other thing I found very helpful is that um, people want to learn and present their problems, but they want to operate anonymously. So you can yeah. tell the person who shall protect your identity Just tell us the situation you're going through. You don't have to tell us your name or where you live because people still feel embarrassed to say these things. 
And yeah. out of that, you're able to gain people's confidence and they can be able to trust you as a good source for problems on infertility. Yeah. Um, Thank you very sorry, much. I, I, Thank I, you I, very I, much for all <laughs> these ideas. And uh, déjà, je vois uh, des émissions en perspective par rapport à ce que je viens d'apprendre. Uh, comme quoi, uh, à chaque fois, nous avons besoin de formation. Merci mm. beaucoup. <laughs> Merci. Um, yes, All right. Juste pour rajouter un truc à ce que euh, Marie-Hélène vient, vient de nous demander, donc comment, euh, yes. comment, avoir, comment avoir une audience, euh, plus, comment avoir une audience euh, plus appliquée, impliquée. Donc ici, euh, je vais donner l'exemple de Radio Plus peut-être, il y a une émission sur la santé tous les mardis euh, où c'est devenu... Euh, le rendez-vous santé de, du mardi, c'est à le docteur. Donc, euh, la formule qui marche, c'est l'interaction avec euh, le public. Euh, nous avons vu, euh, surtout par rapport au sujet tabou comme euh, la sexualité, l'infertilité, etc., que les gens ne vont pas vers les institutions médicales, ne vont pas aller voir les médecins, etc. On, 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 on peut en parler, mais qu'à travers la radio, euh, anonymement, ils se sentent plus à l'aise et arrivent à partager leur histoire. On le remarque justement euh, à travers l'émission Allo Docteur, où euh, d'habitude l'émission est divisée en deux. On a 30 minutes consacrées euh, aux professionnels de la santé. Donc le médecin vient expliquer euh, les, les causes, les traitements existants, etc. Donc pour mettre en perspective euh, le problème. Et la deuxième partie de l'émission est consacrée aux auditeurs. Donc les, les auditeurs peuvent appeler et parler directement au médecin qui est sur le plateau pour poser leurs questions. Et là, on voit que vraiment les gens appellent et se confient. Ils disent, ils racontent leurs histoires, des histoires que probablement ils n'allaient pas parler à leur médecin face à face, mais qu'à travers la radio et euh, justement euh, l'aspect, euh, le fait de rester anonyme leur permet de, de partager un peu plus euh, leurs histoires. Et ça, c'est une formule que je trouve moche parce qu'à la longue, c'est devenu aussi un rendez-vous tous les mardis. Les gens savent qu'il y aura un différent euh, expert qui sera sur le plateau. Donc, euh, ça, c'est peut-être une formule de, pour retenir les gens autour des, des, des sujets qui, qui intéressent, qui intéressent tout le monde. Voilà. OK, thank you so All right. much. Very good contribution there. Thank you so much, Fatima. I hope uh, that we are getting some of these things really insightful and good to, uh, you know, be learning from colleagues. Um, before we, before I let you go, uh, let me uh, welcome back Dr. Lugano. Jean Claude was asking some of the, the causes of infertility in, in Africa, if you would quickly go through some of them. All right. Now, uh, thank you for uh, that question. Um, I think from my slide presentation, the way we would want to look at the causes, the causes will be almost the same worldwide. But I think when we were emphasizing the issue of the infection in Africa, that's the one that causes the most problems in us. So infection, therefore, would lead to damage mainly to the tubes. So the tubes then get blocked. And mainly that's in females. That's where we were talking about the 85% um, being due to infection in females. But the same infection causes um, problems in males well, where the tubes, where the sperms have to go through can get blocked. So again, infection will be more common uh, as a cause of infection, of infertility in both males and females. Now, if we go back to that diagram that we were showing in terms of the reproduction, so let me just look at females first of all. Therefore, if we look at the ovaries, the ovaries can have two problems. Number one is problems with producing the eggs. So the eggs can get finished, just like what happens in menopause. So women may not have um, eggs at all uh, that they can produce for them to conceive. So 
like in cases where um, age plays a big role, um, some women even younger than 40, younger than 35 may find that just because their body did not have enough eggs, they may not be able to produce any more and then that will lead to problems of um, not conceiving. And again, there are hormones that work on the ovaries themselves to produce the eggs. Now, there are special conditions that women may be born with uh, that will affect them uh, in terms of the hormones that they can have for them to produce the eggs. So these are medical problems. And you will also hear when maybe you are sick with things like diabetes or hypertension, and you'll be told by your doctor that to say that some of these will also affect you in terms of conceiving. Basically, they might affect you in terms of the hormones that work on the ovaries. We've now spoken about the infection damaging the, the tubes. My colleague emphasized on two conditions. One of them was endometriosis. And we know that endometriosis, just like infection, can affect the tubes in terms of the passage uh, of the eggs there. So conditions like endometriosis, conditions like infections, those will damage the tubes. Um, if they damage the tubes, then the passage will be blocked. There won't be any communication. Now, when we look at the uterus itself, there are things that can grow in the uterus that will affect the pregnancy to implant. So we're talking of things like fibroids, you hear about polyps or you hear about, you know, adhesions coming in because of infections, especially when women have had unsafe abortion, they may end up having infection in the uterus or when they've delivered and they've had an infection that can cause, you know, scarring in the uterus and that will affect comfortable area where the pregnancy can 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 implant so all this will be part of the female problems that can lead to infection so we group them mainly from ovarian problems problems with the tubes of problems with the uterus or problems with the hormones that work on the uterus so there are all those four categories but when we look into africa what could be the main reason why someone would have problems um, uh, with infertility, it is usually due to infection and infection will cause damage to the tubes as well as the uterus. Okay, now when we go to the male factors, male factors again, we group them into three areas. Number one is where the hormones that we need for them to produce the sperms and the testicles are not there. And those can come in because of medical problems. If one had a head injury, for example, or some people are on medication that are affecting the hormones to be produced. Um, and then the second thing is we're looking at the testicles. They have to be in a good environment. That's why we're talking about things like temperature affecting the testicles, um, then the factory itself will not be able to work. And then we're also looking at medical conditions that can affect the testicles themselves, things like cancer, for example, if you've gone even for cancer treatment or you had you know, a road accident and that has damaged your testicles. Again, after the sperms have been produced, they have to move through the tubes to be to come out. So if those tubes are affected, and most of the times in our cases, it's due to infection. So if one has had a sexually transmitted infection, that can lead to the blockage of the, the tubes where the sperms have to move. Or at times there are conditions where people are born with, you know, the tubes being not not being there. So therefore there won't be any passages. So there are wide causes of, of infertility, both in males and females, but these how, this is how we probably have to, to, to group them for people to understand. And there were questions that uh, people asked whether this can be in, inherited or so on. So we know that there are genetic conditions where people are born, for example, with problems that can lead to hormones uh, not being produced problems where your ovaries are not having enough eggs for them to be released, um, problems with the tubes where, for example, in males especially where the tubes cannot be there, 
and in males as well we know that some of the testicles may not descend to a correct position and therefore that will lead into problems there are all these these conditions that we we have to deal with but the key thing in africa and the things that we try and look at is because most of these are avoidable factors especially when we're looking at issues of infection that's why we're trying to say people have to play it safe we have to educate people and so on because we know that most of these are uh, can be prevented then that 95% issue of infection that we're looking at these are things that we can try and prevent and that's why we're trying to drive the information to say we need to teach people they have to be safe they have to play it self education is very important in terms of prevention um of infertility in our setup because we know that infection plays a key role i hope that answers the question yes that is well uh, explained thank you so much uh doctor i hope uh, john uh, cloud uh, got uh, the answer there um i see so rani rani saying thank you so much uh thank you everyone for participating please keep the conversation thank you very much thank you so much i'm here yes i was going to invite you <laughs> keep this, keep this conversation in your whatsapp uh, so dr rasha uh, yes um uh, uh talk to us and also um as as we leave uh, about the awards uh so uh people can be a part of them yes uh i would like to thank all of you and thank our distinguished speakers uh our uh, health experts and our media experts uh to guide us uh, how to um come up with stories that report uh, stories and media reports about infertility stigma empowering infertility raise awareness about infertility prevention and male infertility and also empowering girls in education and raising awareness about corona uh, virus uh, and the health uh, aspects uh, i would like also to thank all the uh, attendees and the, our media representative from Mauritius from Seychelles from uh, uh, Madagascar and i would like to thank our partner uh, uh, our partner uh, Mauritius Media Trust and uh, um, i'm very happy that i am uh, here today and of course i'd like to thank Brian to moderating all uh, all this uh, session uh, i am i'm encouraging i'm inviting all of you please apply for the awards it would be a great uh, contribution from your side to deliver uh, the messages that can create a culture shift and can empower uh, communities i was a right uh, way of thinking and uh, the whole uh, cause we are advocating for to be the voice of the voice is not only in Mauritius Seychelles and and uh, Madagascar but also in all africa because every article every uh, media work will go uh, along globally because thanks to the technology and the internet and the, the websites and all this everything will be read everywhere and you are talking in english and french and this will cover a huge uh, area of africa and asia uh, so i'm looking forward to hear from you and uh, besides the awards we are going to give for uh, which is a monetary award for uh, for the uh, winners it will be also part of my foundation alumni who will be always working with you in your countries and uh, there's a lot of scope of work and we will have also mentorship uh, program that you're going to have access to our website it's a fantastic website a uh, uh, master course of media uh, writing stories uh, photography making films and all these uh, courses you will be able to uh, read uh, from uh, from this website we are going to give for the media winners but also all your work you're going to apply for we will make it in a book uh, or a, a, a publication that everyone can also read and will be um, as a reference uh kept for uh, generation and generation to come so um great to see you and i'm very looking forward to uh, see you again uh face to face this time next time in uh, in Mauritius or anywhere in Africa 
uh, not to infiltrate the stigma, still not to infiltrate the stigma. And I'm looking forward to uh, to uh, work with you closely and uh, to celebrate you in the ceremony of the winners uh, uh, next time. <laughs> Brian. Thank you so much, Doc, uh, Senator Dr. Russia. Uh, and uh, there you have it. Please uh, head over to uh, the uh, websites and uh, see those categories and be a part. Uh, one, once again, I want to thank uh, Media Trust Board, Mauritius, of course, Mac Foundation, uh, wouldn't do this without you, and the entire team. That, is, uh, that has helped organize this media training for Mauritius, Madagascar, and Seychelles. I'm also looking forward to seeing all of you in person when we finally uh, kick COVID out. Uh, take care of yourselves, stay safe, and uh, let's keep talking online. And uh, yeah, God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. <laughs>